1922, there were 123 railway companies serving Great Britain, but that was far too many. So, in 19... So, the government decided to pass the Grouping Act of 1923, which condensed these 123 companies down to four, which collectively became known as the Big Four. The London, Midland and Scottish Railway, the London and North Eastern Railway, the Great Western Railway, and the Southern Railway. This year, I want to do four live streams, a series of four live streams, were dedicated to talking about each of these four companies. And this stream, the first stream in this series, is going to cover the sister, the railway network, with arguably the richest and most interesting history, the Great Western Railway. Nearly 4,000 miles, a nearly 4,000 mile network running all the way down to the southwest in, and Cornwall, serving the West Midlands and most of Wales. So yeah, it's gonna be a fun, a fun stream tonight, guys. Hold on. Got a lot to talk about tonight. Hold on. Uh... Hold on, I'm just, uh, I'll ha say hello to everyone in a moment. I'm just letting everyone know the stream started. Just a minute. Right then, lovely. So, who have we got? Who have we got? Right, so, hello to Jacob, Blockside Productions, John Murray, Davin, and that's everyone. Oh, and Stan. Yeah, lovely to see you all. So yeah, there's a lot to talk about tonight. It's going to be a fun one. So we're going to talk about the entire history of the Great Western Railway. It was the only one of the big four companies to... Um, it was the only one of the big four companies to keep its original identity. Yeah, it was the only one of the big four companies to keep its original identity. So we're going to talk about its history, it's going from uh, going from its very earliest days under Brunel, all the way right through its big four era, talking about all of its um, all of the fantastic locomotives. Not sure, Jacob. Talking about all of all of the fantastic locomotives um, designed by George Jackson Churchwood and Charles Collett, as well as Brunel, a few maybe a few of Brunel's other achievements as well as um, yeah maybe a few of Brunel's other achievements as well as he is relevant to the Great Western Railway. And, um, and maybe we'll also drive a few, um, GWR locomotives on Roblox. Okay. It's lovely to see you all. There aren't many of you here yet. Just pouring this out. So yeah, it's lovely to see you all. Hello to Spyro and Cinder, and hello MLP fan. Chat's not very active at the moment. 
usually my themed live streams get more viewers. I really do hope everyone else will be here. Especially the five. I've been looking forward to showing them. I've been looking forward to showing them this whole everything about the Great Western Railway. Right. Ugh, just take these off. All right, Pet Squad fan. Let's take these socks off. Right, so, we'll start off tonight, we shall start off tonight, where the Great Western Railway began, with its construction. You guys may remember Mark Williams on the rails. We watched the episode Moving Mountains at the start of the um, Narrow Gauge Railway stream. Oh. Excuse me. Yeah, we watched the... Uh... Yeah, the Pannier Tanks are very nice. Well, my favourite's the Castle Class. But we'll get to that later. So, what better way to start this stream than... Than a, than a documentary on the GWR's genesis through Isambard Kingdom Brunel. Mm. Uh, let me think, let me think. Yep. Ah, shit. Where's the, where are my thoughts? No, Jacob, I don't think so. If we are going to play Roblox, it'll be a, like a, a more realistic GWR game. Right, uh... So, yeah, the GWR Genesis. So, you guys may remember us, may remember Mark Williams on the rails. We watched the episode... About narrow gauge railways during the narrow gauge railway stream, but stream. But I'm bringing Mr. Williams back for this episode, for this stream, and he's going to tell us about the Great Western Railway's construction. It's very dangerous construction, and also the man behind it all, Isambard Kingdom Brunel. God, I thought there would be we'd have more people here at the start. Uh. Oh, fantastic, John Murray. Yeah, and I do hope the others, like Odd and Victor, etc., I hope they all come. I hope they all show up. I know Electro and Neon will, but I hope Odd, Victor, and Charcoal do at some point. Right! So, while we wait for them all to arrive, let's get into this. Let's get into the Great Western Railway's construction. Let's go. <laughs> This is loud enough. No, I just turn off the desktop audio a bit. Oh, and even if Odd and Victor don't show up at this, during this, I'm going to rewind it and show them all the um, the most notable parts. All the most notable facts. GWR, the Great Western Railway. 
He crossed over rivers, was blasted through hills, and hundreds died in its construction. And this gigantic, wonderful, radical piece of engineering was conceived and designed as a whole by one man, Isambard Kingdom Brunel. Brunel's chosen field of engineering was tough and competitive. Many other players were jostling for the top jobs. George Stevenson had just built a fast-moving steam-powered line from Liverpool to Manchester, the world's first intercity railway. Major towns and cities needed their own engineering visionaries to keep their futures on track. On track, forget it. At the beginning of the 19th century, Bristol was still considered to be England's second city. The Bristol merchants were losing out to their upstart like rivals in the north. To hold on to its status, Bristol needed to find an engineer it could trust to improve its transport links with London. And Brunel seemed to be the ideal choice. In 1831, two years previously, the brilliant young engineer had won a competition. He had beaten the great engineer, Thomas Telford. The idea was to build a bridge over the Avon Gorge, 214 meters wide and 75 meters deep. Brunel's design was for a single span suspension bridge, the Clifton Suspension Bridge. <laughs> Ah, oh, this bridge is such a beauty. The technology and know-how to build big suspension bridges had been around nearly a hundred years, but Brunel's design was on such a grandiose scale that it required some very careful calculations. The competition rules stated a maximum load on the supporting chains of five and a half tonnes per square inch of chain. Brunel worked out a design that would place a load of only four tonnes per square inch. His nearest rival was more than six tonnes. He ends up like with this rows. absolutely perfectly balanced suspension bridge. And every time a vehicle goes across the bridge, you can see it's absolutely perfectly balanced. Look, it floats above the Avon Gorge. It was a mathematical masterpiece and let Bristol know that Brunel could tackle difficult engineering problems and come up with radical results. And he knew how to make things had beautiful as in their well. engineer, the right man in the right place at the right time. What does everyone think of that then? This whole wide shot of the Clifton suspension bridge. What does everyone think of it? An absolute marvel that is, if you ask me. Hello, gamer. We've just started. All right, MLP fan, what do you think of the Clifton Suspension Bridge? We've just started. So right now we're covering one of Brunel's earlier achievements, the Clifton Suspension Bridge. Not the best bridge. Oh, I thought for sure you would have... You would have really liked it, Stan. What is your favourite road slash railway bridge then, Stan? In 1833, Bristol's newly formed railway company saw the potential an energetic Isambard had to offer and commissioned... You're off already, Jacob? There you go, Stan. There's your favourite one, a pannier. Granny, um... You're off already, Jacob. How come? You're coming back, though. But there you go, Stan. Just going to pause it there. Let you admire the pannier's beauty. And onwards. Him to build their steam-powered line from Bristol to London. But it wasn't going to be an easy journey. The Tyne Bridge is your favourite bridge. Oh, uh, which one? The Road Bridge or the um or the Metro? 
Oh yeah, you preferred, you said the road, the green road bridge you found you stand. After Brunel's initial preliminary study, a much more detailed survey was needed. Assistants were employed and Brunel was to superintend the whole business. His first diary... That was, that was BR Black, that was, I believe, well, a form of black. But me personally, I prefer them in green. Brunel was to superintend the whole business. His first diary entry reads, up at five, and the following weeks were much the same. Long days in coach and on horseback searching for elusive assistance and long nights in inns poring over maps and estimates. He can- I always get confused, Stan. Confess to a friend, between ourselves, it is harder work than I like. I'm rarely much under 20 hours a day at it. Oh my God. Yeah, Brunel was such a hard worker. He worked so damn hard. Would you, would any of you guys be able to work 12 hours at 20, would any of you guys? Would any of you guys be able to work 20 hours a day? Hang on a moment. Just messaging everyone again. Well, a few of them. I would never, nor would I, John Murray. Yeah, nor would I. Anyone could. Sit, at, sit looking at maps for 20 hours. All oh, right. Well, Brunel did. Well, he had to go on coach and horseback searching for assistance as well. It took him nearly two years to complete his plans. The hills and rivers he plotted all posed major headaches for his dream of providing the fastest, smoothest railway possible. Oh, well, um, that's not relevant to the stream, but okay. Um, So yeah, at the moment we're talking about Brunel's the the construction of the original Great Western Railway line from London to Bristol. The fastest, smoothest railway possible. Brunel decided on the flattest possible route from Bristol to London. It makes complete sense. And south east possible to Bath, route. then on to Reading and London, giving him a gradient of rarely more than three metres per mile. On his railway, Brunel wanted the tracks to be built as level as possible. The more inclines, the slower the journey would be, and the more fuel his engines would use. Although he had completed his plans by November 1833, it wasn't until the last day Hello, of August... Hello, Neon. Lovely 18, to see you. 30, nice, 18... nice to see you here nice and early. Saw a 166, yeah. Nice to see you here nice and early. So at the moment, Neon, we're watching an episode of Mark Williams on the rails. In this, he talks about the initial construction of the Great Western Railway from the original line from London to Bristol. Hopefully, Electro will be here soon the as well. For his dream of providing the fastest, smoothest railway possible. Again. I've been on there. Bruno decided on the flattest possible route from Bristol to London. All right, now. And south east to Bath, then on to Reading and flattest London. possible route. Giving him a gradient of rarely more than three metres per mile. On his railway, Brunel wanted the tracks to be built as level as possible. Yeah. The more inclines, the slower the journey would be, and the more fuel his engines would use. Makes complete sense. Although he had completed his plans by November 1833, it wasn't until the last day of August, 
1835 that the bill to build the Bristol to London line received royal assent after some epic parliamentary battles. One hearing lasted 57 days and cost the new company £88,710 in expenses. An unheard of sum. Brunel's cross-examination was a gruelling 11 days, but it was a brilliant performance. Yes. One of the crowd of landowners and engineers that filled the committee room said, Oh, and there's another one in the background. His knowledge of the land on. surveyed by him was remarkably great. He was rapid in thought, clear in speech. He never said too much, nor lost his presence of mind. I can't remember having such an intellectual treat as that of listening to Brunel's examination. Intellectual treats. Oh, what Brunel know, didn't next say in parliamentary really committees impressive. was to prove his genius. In the new Railway Act, he hadn't mentioned the type of gauge he was going to Pay attention to, to this, everyone. He was ready to put forward his big idea. Brunel wanted to build the fastest, smoothest railway in the country. And just because George Stevenson had started using a gauge of four foot eight and a half inches didn't mean that all railways would have to be built to that dimension. So, Brunel chose a broad gauge, seven feet from rail to rail. Yeah, that was a huge increase in scale. It meant he could have bigger locos. They could be faster. He could have bigger carriages. Game. It would be bigger, better, very exciting, a lot less northern. A lot less northern. <laughs> I bet that term pisses you off, Stan. Uh, that quote pisses you off, Stan. A lot less northern. Found out that the Buxton line from Chapin the Phone climbs at quite a rate and paces will ban from it due to their poor speed. Makes sense. But yeah, Brunel's logic was, before descending into Buxton, yeah. But yeah, Brunel's logic was that larger trains would mean a lower centre of gravity, they'd be more aerodynamic, and he could have larger wheels. Hello Jupiter and hello James. And he could have larger wheels on his engines. Yeah, he could have larger wheels on his engines. Which would allow for more traction and less friction. Okay, Neon. Well, Brunel's quote was saying that the GWR would be bigger, better, very exciting, and a lot less northern. A lot less northern. I bet that term pisses you off. All right, then, Jupiter. But yeah, Brun Brunel's logic was larger wheels, meaning more traction and less friction, lower centre of gravity, more aerodynamic, and wider trains would also mean better capacity. So greater speed and greater capacity. It made complete sense. It was indeed. But what does everyone think of that? What does everyone think of the idea of real... What do you? What does everyone think of the idea of really wide trains? <laughs> Brunel's broad gauge trains were basically <laughs> the train equivalent of the wide Putin meme. <laughs> Something I'll go into detail when, a bit more when Odd comes in. Bigger trains are mostly never better. Br Brunel would would have disagreed with you, Stan. It's a shame that none of the original Isambard Kingdom Brunel locomotives are still around. Indeed. Though there are a few replicas, Firefly and Iron Duke at the Didcot Railway Centre. I've never liked Broad Gauge. But you told me that the you told me yesterday that you thought it that you thought the engines were okay though. What do you think of this neon? Broad what do you think of Brunel's seven foot broad gauge neon? And his wide trains? Late to the party as I was practicing for a Smash Ultimate Tournament. I was practicing for a Smash Ultimate Tournament. Okay, that's fine. Um, that's fine, uh, James. I do remember playing on the GWR between Reading and Paddington on 
rail works in 2007. I had, nice, I had the, um, I had the GW, welcome back Davin. I had part of the GWR on, um, I had part of the GWR on Train Simulator 2013. I had the section between Paddington and Oxford. You say you don't hate them. That doesn't mean I don't look, I like them. All right. Okay. Oh, you didn't know it was a different gauge. Oh, okay. Well, it was neon. Brunel chose a broad gauge, seven feet from rail to rail. Bigger locos, faster, big, greater capacity. Yeah, welcome back, Devon. Okay. Hang on, I'm just gonna... Get the last of this side around of the can, then we'll continue. I used to build my own fictional maps on trains, so did I. I was never able to recreate the R the Redcliffe and Guinea Bridge Railway in trains, though. Tend to learn something new every day. It's not every day for me, but most days. And, oh yeah, and you can tell Mark Williams is a tall bloke if he fits if he fits exactly within um, Brunel's tracks. You can you can tell he's around seven feet, which is pretty tall. His charm. Brunel soon convinced his backers that his broad tracks would work. A lot wider. He surveyed his they route. Wide he decided on his gauge, and trains. everything seemed to be in place for him to start building the Great Western Railway. Really but it was still not a foregone conclusion. The use of I think gauge. so too. I think so too, James. He surveyed his route, he decided on his gauge, and everything seemed to be in place for him to start building the Great Western Railway. But it was still not a foregone conclusion to use a broad gauge. Brunel himself had said that if the Great Western Railway was forced to share a terminus at Euston with the London and Birmingham, we would have to abandon our gauge. Fortunately for Brunel, an alternative site was found. Land was purchased, great expense from the Bishop of London, at Paddington for the terminus of the Great James Western Railway. Liar. Oh wait, no. No, it wasn't line, it was a 14... 100 tank engine. London and Paddington for the terminus of the Great Western Railway. Yeah, Paddington. The GWR's London terminus. Now, it's worth noting that the Paddington we all know today wasn't actually completed until 1854. Or originally, Paddington... Paddington opened in 1838, but in a slightly different location as a temporary terminus. So this is not the same Paddington that was around when the broad gauge GWR first opened. This this grand terminus didn't show up until this grand terminus didn't show up until 1854. Hello, William. I was um, hoping you'd join us tonight. I never went into Paddington Station when I visited London that one time. I know you've been to a few stations though, Neon. Uh, yeah. So at the moment, we're watching a documentary, Mark Williams on the Rails. You might remember it, uh, William. This is about the construction of the initial Great Western Railway, Brunel's broad gauge line. With all the permissions granted and land purchased, he now began to forge his Bristol to London route. It, it was hard, back-breaking work, and his wide lines caused total devastation to the surrounding countryside. Brunel was 30 when constructed. Paddington Bear was named after the railway station, John Murray. I know, Neon. Brunel was 30 when construction started in 1936. There were hardly any precedents for civil now. engineering projects of this size, apart perhaps from the pyramids. Think about that, guys. At the time, this engineering project was as big as the pyramids. Think about that, guys. Are unique in design and have recognition from many 
exactly neon. God, the Great Western Railway was a project as big as the pyramids back then. Without heavy machinery like this, Brunel needed some real muscle to take on the challenge of building his line. All right, Neon. Now he's weak. You... Don't we see you back soon, though? Without oh, heavy. There you are. Oh, you are still there, Stan. Boring railways end at terminus stations. The best ones end at big industrial sites. Eh, if you say so, Stan. Apart perhaps from the pyramids. And of course, heavy the Paddington we know today have Paddington Bear become the mascot of the station. Exactly, William, and there's also a statue of Brunel there. Machinery like this, Brunel needed some real muscle to... I bet Brunel never predicted that his station would later... Within the hour? Okay, cool. I bet Brunel... I bet Brunel never predicted that his station would go on to be... To have a bear be named after it. Without heavy machinery like this, Brunel needed some real muscle to take on the challenge of building his line. Navvies were employed, many of whom hadn't built railways before, mainly because there hadn't been many railways to build. No, they hadn't. Not at that time. Here's a quote. Yeah, navvies had to forge the line. I think as fine a spectacle as any man can oh, witness who is accustomed to look at work, is to see a cutting in full operation, with about 20 wagons being filled, every man at his post, and every man with his shirt open working in the heat of the day, the gangers looking about, and everything going like clockwork. It was a fine sight to see the Englishmen that were there, with their muscular arms and hands hairy and brown. Yes. Got to get your hands dirty sometimes. A navvy, given good conditions, could dig a trench three feet wide, Three feet deep and 36 feet long in one day. And lift it all above his head. Yes. Lift it all above his head. Navvies were extremely dedicated people. Hello, A. Smith. At the moment, we're watching a documentary about the construction of the original broad gauge Great Western Railway, Brunel. The Danger Mouse rebuilt had an inventor chimp villain named Ism Islamabad King Kong Brunel. What? As the oh, navvies cleared the way for Brunel's broad lines, parts of the railway were starting to take shape. But he was about to hit the first oh, major construction problem that could destroy his iron road to London. This was really infamous. What he's about to However talk about. careful you are about avoiding obstacles, and Brunel's Great Western Railway was often jokingly referred to as the Great Way Round. Great Sooner or later, rounds. in the United Kingdom, you come across a major obstacle. And this was Brunel's, Box Hill. Couldn't go over it, had to go through it. The normal method, followed by canal and railway engineers, was to keep your bore as small as possible. But that wasn't Brunel's way. He was going to drive two seven-foot broad-gauge lines through this hill. This is Box Tunnel, and nearly two miles long, it was the greatest railway tunnel ever attempted, and an infamous piece of engineering, if ever there was one. It couldn't be dug out, it had to be blasted. Brunel's navvies were forging yeah. his iron road across the south of England. This, as a, I always the work was grueling, and in kid. places like Box Tunnel, it was also extremely oh, yeah, dangerous. That, yeah, building, now building out Box Tunnel. Box tunnel was just an incredible feat of engineering. Tunnel, it was also extremely dangerous. Right. Tunnels would sand their ground, looking for fractures. There's one. So that's going to come down very easily. Hello, Chair Martin. Nice to see you. Then after you've drilled your hole, this is... we're watching a documentary about the construction of the Great Western Railway at the moment. There's one. Rock fractures. So, that's going to come down very easily. Yeah. Then after you've drilled your hole, you prepare to set your charge. They would have been using black powder, gunpowder. 
for the purposes of demonstration. This will rep represent dynamite. Dynamite. <laughs> so, <laughs> I love his the West Country accent he briefly does there. Exactly, A. Smith. We will, this is more. This stream will be more about the real life Great Western Railway, but we may talk about Duck and Oliver a little bit. Oh, nice, William. Purposes of demonstration. This will rep represent dynamite. Dynamite. So the black powder would have been fed into the hole, and then just like a gun, a muzzle-loading gun on a, on a Napoleonic ship, it would have had a wad behind it. So if we pretend that's R charge no, no, and this got a tamping rod here hang on a minute no he's got an Irish Wood. accent I think no sparks and then you would have tamped the charge home if the rock hadn't already fallen on you and by the time you drilled this you hadn't put any more down this was probably the most dangerous portion of the job yet because this can become a projectile <laughs> And then it would have impaled another worker as it shot across, as the dynamite blew it across. Would have impaled another worker. Just like in Commando, where Arnie impales Bennett with, with a piece of pipe. Yeah, we, yeah, we are going to talk about Brunel's other achievements a little later, including his steamships. Are you still there, Stan? What does everyone think of this? What does everyone think of how dangerous building all this was? This was probably the most dangerous portion of the job yet because this can become a projectile. Chaos. The pressure to build the railways fast meant that health and safety was never a major concern. Construction of early railway lines maimed and killed many of the brave men that built them. One of the things I used to do oh, was cool. use a piece of quill, slice that, and add more black powder, and then jam that yeah, in. One thing and then how once you'd laid your works. charge, used a naked flame, another nice, another safety, nice feature. safety feature. The light fuse. Except it wasn't a safety feature because a lake, because it is, it is in such unsafe condition. Except the naked flame isn't a safety feature because it could ignite stray gunpowder. Because it can ignite stray gunpowder, and um, it can ignite stray gunpowder and cause unwanted explosions. All building, well, yeah, but back in the eighteen thirties, it was even more dangerous. Stan, health and safety was health. Health. There was no such thing as health and safety back during the eighteen. Um, 30s when it came to construction in fact guys and i learned this fact from the documentary on isambard kingdom brunel that jeremy clarkson did in term in percentage terms you were more likely to die building box tunnel than you were in the trenches during world war one what do you think of that guys that you were more likely to die building box tunnel than in the trenches. Loses his shit when Kelly Chris shows up. Okay. I always thought that sounded funny because flames don't wear clothes anyway. I know. But naked flame means nothing to like contain or protect the flame. Nothing to stop it from igniting anything you don't want it to ignite. Used a naked flame, another nice safety feature. Like yourself, it is. The light really scary, fuse, William. and then traditionally, leg it. How fast you had to run depended yeah, on how long you cut, cut your fuse. Leg it. Exciting. 
Nowadays, whenever railways, whenever brand new railway tunnels have to be blasted out, it's done far more safely and in a far more controlled way. You are less likely to die in a trench. Trenches provide cover and safety. They are designed to keep soldiers safe. I think what Jeremy meant was you are le you are less you are more likely to die you are less likely to die fighting in World War One than you were than you were um building box tunnel. Yes. But yeah, nowadays it's done in a much more controlled m manner. Exactly, William. But even but even but even some, but even tunnel boring machines can't d drill through some forms of rock. So blasting still has to be employed during the construction of some tunnels. Now I don't know. Um, well, Jeremy Clarkson said so. Don't believe everything you hear. All right. <coughs> Yeah, even yeah, even tunnel boring machines can't drill through some forms of rock, so they have to. Um, so blasting does still have to be employed. But yeah, nowadays, whenever um, whenever but nowadays, whenever blasting um. Where Benjamin is, I don't know. Yeah, nowadays, whenever blasting has to be employed during the construction of railway tunnels, they use fast, more controlled methods. They use nitroglycerin and primer cords in a far more controlled way, and they don't have to run away when um when when they don't have to ignite the fuse and run away. They just got to press a button to blow it up. Oh, it's been a while since we've seen you, new route master fan. Welcome. I've never heard of him, so I don't have an opinion, you Route Master fan, but it's nice to see you here. It's been a long time since we've seen you. But yeah, nowadays nitroglycerin and primer cord are used in blasting mainly. <laughs> And you just gotta press a button and you don't have to run away. That actual explosion, you can tell here that that actual explosion you saw, it wasn't the gunpowder, it was the um That explosion was actually done with in a far more safe manner with nitroglycerin. Of course, the thing that nobody's allowed to say is that people kept doing things like this because it's exciting. Yes, it is very exciting. Explosions are very consume, exciting. A ton of Except fireworks. And a ton of the only explosions that are very exciting. It's exciting. I'm sorry, I have to go. I'm so tired. No problem, William. Thank you for coming. I'm glad you came. I'm glad you came at all. It's nice. It's nice. It's been nice to see you, William. Thank you so much for coming. We'll see you next week. I have to go. Yeah, it's okay, William. Thanks for coming. Hopefully, we'll see you next week. Because it's exciting. Oh, oh! I accidentally turned the volume all the way up. The tunnel consumed a ton of candles and Wait, a ton I make it of gunpowder. Yes, because it's exciting. The tunnel consumed a ton of candles and a ton of gunpowder every week. A hundred Good. horses and carts pulled the 30 million bricks to line it. Well, it wasn't that. Oh, it, it was on the right volume. The tunnel consumed a ton of candles, of candles and, and a ton, ton of, of gunpowder every week. A hundred horses and carts pulled the 30 million bricks to line it. Who counted them? I don't know. It took five years to finish Box Tunnel. And apart from using steam pumps to clean the water and blasting powder, it was all done with muscle. 
men and horsepower, but at a terrible cost. Over a hundred men lost their lives, and many, many more oh, were seriously injured and maimed. My boy, chicken and pasta is for dinner. And many, many more were seriously injured and maimed. And in the days before anaesthetic, it doesn't really bear thinking about it. No, it doesn't, especially when surgery had to be done, like, in, like, while the patient was still away. Bath Hospital about that. used to resemble a field dressing station during a major battle. Brunel was once showed a list of 131 men maimed and seriously injured during a 20-month period. He said, I think it is a very small list considering the very heavy works and the immense amount of gunpowder used. Yes, indeed. I don't know. I don't know. EG, I'll have to ask someone. I know, MLP fan. Oh yeah, they were still using HSTs back when this was filmed. It wasn't just the loss of life at Box Tunnel that was a problem for him. People weren't keen on travelling underground either. After all, it was a bit closer to hell. Oh yes, and people were also worried that the lack of oxygen in the tunnel combined with the speed of the train meant that the air would be sucked out of their bodies and they die. But that's not how tunnels work, as we've discovered. And nowadays, trains travel through tunnels at twice or even three times the speed that the original GWR engines did. But Brunel was never deterred from making big decisions or trying out something new. Oh yeah, and uh, oh, oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. If you look closely, guys, you can see how wide the. You can, if you if you look closely, guys, you can see how wide that tunnel, a uh, box tunnel is, as it was built to accommodate the original broad gauge tracks. <clears throat> Deterred from making big decisions or trying out something new. Brunel turned the accepted wisdom of how to lay a railway completely on its head. There are no transverse sleepers, which is how we imagine. That's our image of what a railway track bed looks like. There's great gaps here with ballast in here because these are the sleepers. They run longitudinally. The rails are laid on top of them. They're tied at intervals. And you'll notice this bit of track that Williams is on is dual gauge, four foot eight and a half standard gauge and broad gauge. Here, here. And then it's spiked every now and again with piles driven into the earth. What happened, and we, what contemporary inspectors criticised, was that in between, the sleepers tended to sag. So you've got this strange switchback ride. A bit like a roller coaster. But it shouldn't just be dismissed as eccentric because at the time, the London and Birmingham railway was using the northern colliery method of stone sleepers and that was a very hard ride indeed yeah i imagine it must have been but yeah what does everyone think of that unconventional method of laying railway tracks what is what do you think of it in, in particular stan oh, so brunel had surveyed his route he got his contractors and his navvies. Very popped open, regulated What he open. needed now was engine. the engines underway. He wanted the fastest, most reliable broad gauge loco he could get. Yeah, a railway is no good without um, locomotives and rolling stock. But he remember, he was a civil engineer, not a locomotive engineer. And he laid down some strange stipulations. He was obsessed by weight and low centre of gravity and he ended up with a collection of 18 locomotives from various builders that formed a real motley crew some of which contemporary oh, sources now. said were barely capable of pulling their own weight let alone a train oh, fortunately <laughs> he had employed as his first locomotive superintendent another young genius a man called daniel gooch Daniel Gooch had served his time in it's ironworks and foundries from South Wales to Scotland, I'm and by his late teens, oh, all right, you are you doing something else? Well, it's a very Daniel Gooch had served his time really in ironworks and foundries 
In South here Wales we are, Scotland, the broad gauge locomotives make themselves. Buys late teens time in ironworks and foundries in South Wales to Scotland. And by his late teens, he was already a fully qualified locomotive engineer. Look at that. Look at how big that rim is. Dylan, why are you calling me Dylan, uh, Victor? Well, it's nice to see you. Nice to see you, Victor. Um, no, it's not. Um, is, do you know, is Odd coming a bit later, Victor? So at the moment, Victor, we're watching a documentary on the Great Western Railway's initial construction. Yeah, the original Great Western Railway that was built under Isambard Kingdom Brunel. And we've gotten up to the part in the documentary. We've gotten up to the part in the documentary where, um... No clue? Alright. Well, hopefully he will. Where he talks about the, lo the original locomotives that ran the line. Daniel Gooch had served his time in ironworks and foundries from South Wales to Scotland, and by his late teens, he was already a fully qualified locomotive Jeans engineer. Driving wheels. In 1836, aged 19, Daniel he went Gooch. to work for the Robert Stevenson Company at Newcastle, and there he worked on two broad gauge locomotives destined for export. He was fascinated by the possibilities and said he was delighted to have so much room to arrange the engine. So, when a job came up at the Great Western Railway the following year, he applied immediately. Brunel was delighted with him, engaged him on the spot. And the first thing that Gooch did was persuade Brunel to buy one of the Stevenson locomotives, the North Star. North Star wasn't without its teething problems. So as you can see here, so Victor, earlier I was telling everyone how originally the Great Western Railway was built to a much wider track gauge than most railways. So if you remember from the narrow gauge railway steam, railway track gauge refers to how far apart the rails are and therefore the size of the locomotives that can, um, of the trains that can run on them. So narrow gauge was basically like smaller trains, but broad gauge, which is what the Great Western Railway was originally built to, is the complete opposite. Seven feet. The, the Great Western Railway was originally, originally had rails that were seven feet from rail to rail, as opposed to the normal four foot, eight and a half inch gauge. And the trains that ran on it were basically... Um, the trains that ran on it were basically the equi the train equivalent of the wide Putin meme. So yeah, what do you think about that, Victor? Trains, extremely wide trains, equivalent to the wide Putin meme. A bit later on, once we finish watching this documentary, I'm going to show you all some clips of one of the replica broad gauge locomotives running, accompanied by the wide Putin meme song. Ooga booga. What do you mean by ooga booga, Victor? What does that mean? They just couldn't get the power out of it. They thought they could. So, Brunel and Gooch, who proved to be the most pragmatic of engineers, worked on a new blast pipe, and its improved performance amazed everybody. By increasing the size of the blast pipe and making sure that the steam discharged in the middle of the chimney, they had created an engine which could go faster using less fuel. Incredible. Faster it was by far the most successful of the first GWR engines. Mm -hmm. And Gooch used it as a prototype for a whole new broad gauge class. And this is the first of them. I ain't got a clue what those, what any of those words mean, but yeah, sure. But yeah, but you remember, Victor, remember narrow gauge means narrower tracks broad gauge means wider tracks those trains there was thomas the tank engine yes iron duke was actually in a railway series book you know uh, john murray it's not about how big your blast pipe is it's how you use it <laughs> oh my god Victor, are you saying, are you, are you, are you substituting blast pipe for penis? <laughs> blast pipe as in penis. How do you use your penis? A replica for being built sake. at did broad gauge class. And this is the first well, one. Dan. A replica 
being built at Didcot. Firefly. There were 62 in the class. They had seven foot driving wheels. Seven foot driving On the first wheels. trial, it went from Paddington to Twyford, 31 miles at an average speed of 50 miles per hour, which was unheard of. What you've got to remember is, um, yeah, these trains could typically top out at 60 miles an hour. 60 miles an hour may, um, 60 miles an hour may sound like a pretty normal speed for land vehicles today, but in the, but in the late 1830s, 50 miles an hour was like light speed. Not, no other train had been able to go that fast before. Back then, trains and like horses and coaches, they could only do like, um, they can only do like 20, 30 miles an hour. But 50 miles an hour was like light speed back in the late 1830s. Welsh copy of Thomas and the Great Railway Show, which features Iron Duke. Nice. Gonna be very disgusting. I'm a very refined man. Who'd never see such vulgarity? <laughs> All right. But, th but what does everyone here think of that? 50 miles an hour being like being such a considered such a fast speed back in the late 1830s a very a pretty normal speed now but something like light speed back there on june the 4th 1838 the first section of the line was opened from paddington to maidenhead maidenhead actually it only made it as far as taplow because there was a small problem at maidenhead the Thames. River Thames. All Brunel needed to do was just design a little bridge for oh, his trains to cross. A simple task for an engineer who had just drawn up the plans for the grandest bridge in yeah, Bristol. Suspension bridge. Or was it? Maidenhead didn't want another bridge. They'd already got one, thank you very much, on which they made quite a bit of money charging tolls. And the Thames commissioners wanted to make sure that the river was still free for barge traffic. So Brunel came up with what is commonly called an engineering triumph. The Maidenhead, Maidenhead <laughs> Echo Viaduct. Viaduct. Maidenhead Viaduct. Because the river still had to stay open for navigation, what Brunel was only allowed it, one uh, pier in the centre of the river. Now, if you did build a traditional arch bridge with hemispherical arches, each arch would have to have been 64 feet high much higher than the bank on either side. He would have had a humped backed viaduct, not very practical for a railway. No. So he came up with this daring and simple solution. He flattened the arches. Brunel's secret was in the maths. Guy was a genius. His pages of sketches are surrounded by detailed calculations. He had projected the force on every part of the bridge with great accuracy. Brunel had worked out how to old design arches longer yes, and flatter and than any slow. Brunel had worked out how to design arches longer and flatter than any others built before. Each one is 128 Hello, foot wide, nice rising to, to only 24 foot in the centre. Very wide bridges. He didn't have an electronic calculator. Amazingly, he worked it all out by hand. What does everyone rising. think of this bridge? This um, this really really wide arch bridge. Yeah, it's a great achievement, especially for the time. 24 foot in the center. He didn't have an electronic calculator. Amazingly, he worked it all out by hand. Indeed. The rest of the engineering world thought that this would be Brunel's greatest Gotta failure. Gotta go a year. Don't you mean a second? Well, I hope you'll be back, uh, Victor. And bring Odd with you. Rest a calculator. Amazingly, he worked it all out by hand. The rest of the engineering world thought that this would be Brunel's greatest failure. Yeah, nice bridge, it is. Doom was prophesied. Too flat. It won't stand. Hello, Jacob. Unfortunately, at the moment we're doing a doc. We're watching a documentary about the construction of the Great Western Railway. The, the, the initial construction.
We're nearly at the end of it, but he's talking about the Maidenhead viaduct at the moment. Amazingly, he worked it all out by hand. The rest of the engineering world thought that this would be Brunel's greatest failure. Doom was prophesied. Too flat, it won't stand. Unfortunately, yeah, okay. when Chadwick, the contractor, removed the centering, that's the form, the wooden form that the arch was built on, from the eastern arch, this one, it did sag very slightly. But Chadwick took the blame. He said that he hadn't waited long enough for the special Roman cement to set. And of course, it's still here, and it's still a viaduct. Still a viaduct. And it's all down to Brunel's mathematical genius. Sag, His great iron road between London and London, and it's all down sense. to Brunel's mathematical genius. His great iron road between London and Bristol was nearing we'll come completion. Come back to the key part of this documentary when odd comes, because I want to. Great go iron road as well. between London and Bristol was nearing completion. But at Box Hill, his eccentric and extravagant plans were running into problems. Yeah, they were. Supposed to be finished by August 1840, by December 1840, work had fallen so far behind schedule that Brunel threw 4,000 men and 300 horses working in shifts to try and complete his missing link on his Bristol to London line. Finally finished in June 1841. Ten months behind and it marked schedule. the end of Brunel's epic eight-year struggle to build the line. No wonder he put a nice porch on the front of it. Yeah, that's a very nice tunnel now. Right up there, just through the place of the northern place of the tunnel in Portugal. Isambard had accomplished his grand vision of a broad gauge line from Bristol to London and had kept his promise to the merchants of Bristol to keep their city on the map. His broad lines were eventually built all the way to Penzance, and he completed his final engineering triumph, the Prince Albert Bridge at Tamar, in 1859. Brunel's brave vision of a broad gauge system with a smooth and level road, minimum gradients, great sweeping curves, best possible motive power, and very high standards of design was ultimately a failure. By 1892, the battle was lost, and standard gauge prevailed across the whole system. Yeah. Just imagine what our railways would be like if Brunel had won. Yeah, if Brunel had won, if Brunel had won, and and his bro and his seven foot broad gauge had prevailed across the whole network, um, and his seven foot broad gauge had prevailed across across the UK. Um, we would have had like very wide trains with very high capacity and because of their lower center of gravity they would have been able to go much much faster mallard would have easily been able to go faster than 126 miles an hour yeah it would have been incredible if brunel if all railways had been built to 7 foot gauge Oh, I see you've copied that, Jacob. Hello, Levco. We've just finished documentary on the construction of the original Great Western Railway from Bristol to London, but we will come back to the key point, points of it when Odd shows up. I want to tell him as well. I said, um, where's the handbrake? He said, oh, uh, it's not very good. I, I wouldn't rely on the handbrake. Just use the front bucket. <laughs> bucket it was like blue for real there okay i'm gonna quickly go to the loo throw my cider cans away go to the loo get some water and then i'll be back and when i come back we'll move on to the next um to the next thing i wanted to do in this stream well let's check how things are going in terms of Oh, only 72 views in just over an hour. Not necessarily, Levco, because um, the whole world could have easily had its rallies built to seven foot gauge. Hello, Cassie. Are you actually going to stay a while for once? Oh, nice, James. Nice. Oh, I hope we get a 
Only 72 views in just over an hour. We need a bit more. Oh, welcome back, Victor. Oh, that was that was very quick. That was very quick. I was just about to go to the loo. Oh, and Jacob's back too. Great. Hold on, guys. I am um, kicking in a nonce, yes. Of course it has, Cassie. Oh, really? Really, Cassie? Right, I'm just going to quickly run to the loo. Throw my soda cans away, get some water, and then quickly run to the loo. And then I'll show you that wider Putin meme. If anyone else comes while I'm gone, tell them I've died in a tornado. You all know the drill. I'll be back in a moment, guys. Right, I'm back. What has been happening in the chat? Epic Cassie troll. <laughs> yeah. Was made to make fun of people because I'm opinionated and I love being controversial. I know. Are you still there, Stan? You don't seem to be very talkative tonight, Stan. I thought you'd really enjoy you'd be really into tonight's stream. Right. Uh Right, now I'll show you all, um, there you are, Lewis, I make way, yeah, what about it, um, Levco, right, I'll just show you all, uh, broad gauge, this, the Firefly replica in action now, on Brunel's broad gauge tracks, don't have much to say, that's all, and I'll play the wide Putin, um, the wide Putin meme song over it. Madonna, what does that mean? Are they ruining everything? Oh, I, I have no idea, um, Jacob. Right, I'll play the wide Putin meme over. <laughs> song over this broad gauge locomotive over the firefly replica in action because um you know it's a wise train so it's only fitting that we play the wide putin meme and i want to think about all of it oh cassie's gone rob let me show that briefly right yeah i want to know what everyone thinks of it The last one in my Cam Wick ring was to make someone of DeviantArt. Okay. So lose some make way. I used to thought they I used to think they were saying moose. Well now I know I now I know the truth. Fine off. Right. This music over um over the broad gauge locomotive in action. I wanna know what everyone thinks of it. Ice train shopping. Does everyone think this is fitting? Exactly, me. I'm welcome. 
just showing everyone that Raw gets those motion in action with a white frame. Hang on, I'm going to time it better. Hang on, I'm going to time the music better. <laughs> yeah, what does everyone think? White frame shopping. Does everyone think this music's fitting for this engine? Oh yeah, and back then a lot of people had to travel in open coaches burning. Oh, did you just not have anything to say, Victor? That sounds good to spoil by means. Oh, awesome. No, it's... No. Does everyone think the white Putin meme is fitting for this white crane? Oh, cool, Jacob. That's my thoughts on the matter. Just Burger King. Burger King has nothing to do with Brunel and his Broadcast Railway. <laughs> exactly, okay. So yeah, there's a very short section of Broad Gauge line. Um, I know. I know, John Lowe. Yeah, there's a very short section of a breast of raw gauge line at the Big Pop Railway Centre. Duck is wide. No, he's not wide, but the um, but the broad gauge engines are. Oh, nice neon. <laughs> um, oh, I wonder when the odds gonna show up. <laughs> I'm sure he'd find this funny. Hang on, I just wanna. Oh, is that what? Is that what the music's called? <laughs> I've never been to the Didcot Railway Centre, but while my sister is still at Oxford, which isn't that far from Didcot, I would like to go to the Didcot Railway Centre. It's supposed to be a fantastic place, filled to the brim with Great Western Railway history. All the faces increase dramatically. <laughs> oh no, really, Jacob? A coca melon movie? Hi, hi, hi. Right here, we've got a driver's eye view of this short section of Raw Game Line. What do you think of this, Stan? What do you think of... Stan, do you think that, um... That, that the... what Stan, do you think that the Wide Putin song fits with, um, Broad Gauge Locomotive? <laughs> Oh yeah, and as you can see here, guys, as was very common from like the 1860s onwards until broad gauge, until standard gauge completely took over in 1892, the track here is is dual gauge, one line for standard gauge, the other line for broad gauge. I know, John Murray. Still there, Victor? Don't see it, alright. Don't lie me on for a little bit. I mean, it's kind of rather than the initials. Why is that then, though? Holy. 
Hello, Emerald Boss. Nice to see you. Where are odds, Electro and uh, Charcoal, though? Right. Oh, shit. Right, then. Um... So if you guys wanted an idea of what Brunel's broad gauge locomotives looked like when they were in service, this was it. That was it. That was what you saw. Victor, are you gonna ask God if he's gonna come? Cause, yeah, I thought he would have been here by now. There was some show from the 70s, I remember, just randomly. Playing video games 100%. All right. Well, I, I hope he takes a bit of a break from video games to come join us for a bit. And the gauge there puts this to shame. Just ran coming across the intro super train. What was it even? Was it like even wider than seven foot gauge neon? Far too 70s for me. All right. Anyway. Like a cool Friday, yeah. Oh, by the oh that oh speaking of video games, uh, guys, tomorrow as my parents and sister are going off skiing, starting tomorrow, I'm gonna have a hot like a whole week to myself. So tomorrow I'm gonna do another bonus uh, Spyro live stream. I hope you're looking forward to that. Just wanted to mention that briefly. A oh, damn wide, what like ten foot gauge. Oh my god, if 7 foot gauge is wide, just imagine how wide 10 foot gauge trains would be. I don't think there's actually ever been a railway track gauge wider than Brunel gauge. Yeah, 7 foot gauge today is, is still known as Brunel gauge, which is, which makes sense as it was Brunel who came up with it. I think it's to do with the fact that he always talks about the GWR and having Great Western written on him would be more apparent. I see. I'll likely play Spyro during that stream. Play Spyro while I'm playing it. All right. I think I remember that, Jacob. Anyway, so the next thing. So we've already talked about what um, the Great Western Railway's construction of oh, 15 feet. That was a model of it available on trains. Right. right, so we've already talked about the Great Western Railway's construction. But what about what the railway was like after it opened? What was travelling from London to Bristol on this broad gauge railway like? Well, for a start, well, for a start, it was fast. Very fast. Well, fast for the time, anyway. Hang on, I'm just going to do a bit of a snippet so I can, um... Yes, it was, exactly. I'll try and draw a rough uh, route that the, that the Great Western Railway followed from London to Bristol. Try and roughly draw it, so... When London to Penzance in... No, London to Penzance in five hours, at least today. Back then it was London to Bristol in four hours. Right, so it went from London. Long here, it passed... Oh, shit. Yeah, this could take a while. So it went to the great... Oh, J oh you're joking, right. So, so out of London it went along here. And then it went... Ow, oh, bugger! And that's disgraceful, Jacob. It's also disgusting and despicable. Right, so... This isn't exactly the route the GWR followed. It's just a rough route. Oh, actually, Brunel wanted the straightest possible route, so... So from London... Quite bad at drawing, so it went through Slough. And then down through Reading. And then up this way. 
wait, no, uh, that, that blob there is Didcot, isn't it? Yes, it is. So, ah, shit. Yeah, I'm, I'm really not very good at drawing, so... Oh, no, 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 it wasn't like that. It doesn't go up, so... London... Through Slough... And then down through Reading... Up this way... Through Didcot, and then on to Swindon, and then down through Chippenham, through Bath, then to Bristol. So this was roughly the route that the Great Western Railway followed. Riviera sleeper train, I know. That takes uh, like seven hours. No, not the original line at least, but it did go via Didcot. So yeah, this is roughly the route that the original Great Western Railway took. Are you still there, Victor? Mr. Yellow Generation, so do I, yeah, Levco. So there we are. That's the route of the original Bristol to London route. So yeah, London to Bristol in four hours. Hello, Redstone Boss. We've never seen you before. Welcome. Please subscribe to me if you haven't already. So... So yeah, topping out at around 60 miles an hour. Your journey would top out at around 60 miles an hour. Nowadays, the journey takes 95 minutes of KFC, which is faster than... Which, is, which today is faster than even driving between London and Bristol. So there are still some journeys in the UK that are better to take by train than car. I know Wads prefers travelling by car, so I'm going to tell him that when he shows up. That the UK, that there are still some um, journeys in the UK that the um, that there are still some journeys in the UK that are better to be on by train. Oh, a different channel. Oh, okay then. Uh, Redstone bus. So yeah, this is the route it took. So do I, Neon. I know Stan prefers car, though, so... London. There we are. That's the route. Now, unfortunately... I know you told me before, Stan, but... But it's faster to get between, it's like 50 minutes faster to get between London and Bristol by train, even today. Yeah, I know, Neon. A lot of people do. So, un so unfortunately, unfortunately, back then, trains didn't have facilities. There was, there was, even Odd and Victor would know this, um... So trains today have, um, trains today, like, have corridors going all throughout the coaches so you're able to walk the entire length of the train. Victor, I, I know, I, I think even you and Odd know that you're able to walk through the entire length of trains. Because you two have done train journeys before, for as few as you have done. So I think even you'd know that, being able to walk the entire length of trains. I'll read that in a second, James. But unfortunately, back in the 1840s, the design of coaches didn't allow for that. You just had to sit in compartments. That did allow for greater privacy. Exactly, Neon. And you can see the entire length of them. I can confirm that it is true. We sat between couplers, is what they're called, um, uh, Victor. So did two of you, uh, did two of you sit in one coach and two of you sit in the other? Like you sat right next to the couplers. Yeah, indeed. But yeah, unfortunately, Victor. 
to open the automatic doors between coaches. Yes, think of Star Trek. Yeah, I get that, Neon. So, unfortunately, back in the 1840s, it wasn't possible to walk the entire length of trains. You just had to stay in the compartment. You just had to stay in the compartment you got into. This did allow for greater privacy, and it is much more comfortable. Having, tra have, having travelled in a lot of compartment coaches myself, on the Caledonian Sleeper and on a lot of heritage railways, I can confirm that like old-fashioned compartments do allow for far greater privacy and far greater comfort. But yeah, that's the, dif the disadvantage of 19th century coaches. Although they provide far greater comfort and privacy, you can't walk the entire length of the train of them. So unfortunately, that means you can't walk to a buffet car. A trolley service can't be brought through. A trolley ser a snack trolley service can't be brought through the train. And there aren't even any toilets on the train. So can you believe that, guys? Four hours with no buffet car, no snack trolley service, and not even any toilets. Can you believe that, guys? Would you guys, would any of you be able to put up with that? Oh, sat in between the coaches. Oh, right. What, like? Ah, oh, okay. All right, Neon. Small seat size near the doors of a 158. Put them up for that long. It was annoying. Side seats. Yeah, I know. Class 375s have that as well. All right. Oh, you wouldn't be able to put up with that. I don't blame you, Neon. Gangway area on a pacer and did get a sense of true discomfort. Yeah, I know. I've stood in the gangways of coaches before. Hey, I'm Faraday called Fun Thomas Pingu. All right. Gordon is Jeremy Clarkson. All right. If you can't go four hours without food, you're just greedy. All right. But four hours without without going to the toilet, would any... I understand that Neon wouldn't be able to put up with that, but would any of you guys be able to put up a four-hour train journey where you couldn't even go to the toilet? So, if there were no facilities on, on um, early trains, if there were no facilities on early trains, where... How did you get your refreshments and toilet breaks? So how did you get your refreshments and toilet breaks on um, on um, early trains if there were no facilities on board? Yeah, I know, Stan. But how? But how did you? But how did you get your snacks and use the toilet if there weren't any facilities on board? The answer was is the railway, the Wiltshire town of Swindon. A town which has become synonymous with the Great Western Railway. This is where the, this is where the GWR's main locomotive works were, where they built all their engines, even after that. And Swindon was also... I was frightened to use the toilets on trains. I'm okay with using toilets on trains. I know my mum isn't, though. Feels like you're in the middle of a 3.0 magnitude earthquake. Not for me, it doesn't. You'd fight in Hunger Games-style death matches to get snack and toilet <coughs> privileges? No, not quite, Victor. Just bring some scran with you. Well, yeah, I know, but alternatively... 16 toast slices. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Greedy's usual breakfast. And went to a Muller train show and got a pannier tank. A 64XX pannier tank. Great. And bring a bottle to piss in. Well. But, yeah. This is where you got your refreshments and toilet break back in the day. At Swindon. Because from when the GWR first opened, right up until 1895... The cafe slash tea room at Swindon had stipulated that um, they had stipulated that um, 
They had a contract with the GWR that all trains had to stop at Swindon for at least 10 minutes to, to you know, get, um, to, you know, get, um, refreshments and um, for people to use the toilet. But the thing was, at least according to Horrible Histories, that um, at least according to a Horrible Histories sketch, um, there were no actual toilets on the train. So you had to like piss on the platform with ladies going at one end and gents going at the other end. Can you believe that, guys? Would any of you do that? Like, piss on the platform? Because that's what you had to do back in the 1840s at Swindon if you needed the toilet, if you needed to relieve yourself. Oh, yeah, yeah, they... Of course trains still stop at Swindon these days, Neon, but it's no longer 10 minutes. It's no longer a 10-minute stop. That contract was abolished in 1895. But yeah, it was a bit of an it was a bit of an embarrassment for the GWR having to stop their trains at Swindon for at least ten minutes, if not more. You would. Oh, you would. What about you, Victor? Would you piss on a railway station platform if there were no toilets? Yeah, I know. And also, apparently, the soup they served, also according to the same horrible history sketch, the soup they served in the Swindon Station Cafe was so hot that it couldn't be drunk quickly, so the soup had to go back in the pot, and it kept going around and, like, spread germs and things. It was awful. It meant, like, express trains. Oh, yeah, trains do still stop at Swindon, but not anymore. Like, it's only really trains going to, um, it's only really trains going to, um, like, Cardiff and Bristol these days. I do that every day. What? Piss on, you piss on railway platforms every day, do you, Victor? Like, not into toilets, but on railway platforms, creating puddles of piss. Jesus! All oh, right, cool. Tiny tank in front of the TV, referencing the shots of the train. Cool. Signs at railway station. Yeah, I remember that sketch, Neo, and I've seen it. And there's another GWRB I wanted to show to you, which goes into a bit more detail about the 10-minute tea stop at Swindon. But yeah, there will be a bit more talk about Swindon in this stream. Someone has to. Someone has to piss on railway platforms. Seriously, Victor. <laughs> Oh my god, if Ard was here, that would just make this stream perfect. Oh my god. Name for a 4700? What's, what's that, Levco? Right, uh... Here we are, GWR 1835 from Paddington. We will come back to this as well. If I don't, who will? <laughs> Jesus. Oh yeah, this also talks about Swindon as well. So we'll watch this for a little bit. This is about Swindon. Document, this documentary is a lot older than Some 18, of the stone from, from Box Tunnel found its way to an Some of the stone from oh, Box cool. Tunnel found its way to another Thanks. mammoth enterprise. The building of a new factory at Swindon. To build all the the railway passed through southern England, which had no tradition of mechanical engineering. Brunel and Daniel Gooch started their own industrial revolution. Yeah. In 1840, Brunel established at Swindon in rural Wiltshire. A locomotive repair works. And construction There are obvious works. difficulties in founding such an establishment in such a location. And over the next few years, a whole new town was built at Swindon by the railway company. And a whole workforce imported. Yeah. To accommodate the workforce, brought in mainly from the north of England and Wales, the company built terraces of small but comfortable cottages. Life in Swindon flourished under the benevolent eye of the company. Benevolent. This hospital, now a community centre, was set up by the newly formed Medical Fund Society. 
Each worker contributed fourpence a week to the scheme. And a hundred years later, it was to provide a model for the National Health Service. A model for the National Health Service. So I was talking about this last week, how everyone deserves free health care. I was talking about this last week. And the what people of Swindon contributed four pence a week to their health scheme. And this later became the model for the NHS, which is fantastic. So my father's cum at one point. Oh, for goodness sake, you put milk and sugar in your breakfast, right? So yeah, everyone deserves na deserves free health care. And it's disgraceful how America and so many other countries still don't give their scheme. citizens free health care. A hundred years later, it was to provide a model for the National Health Service. The men formed the Mechanics Institute, where they mastered the skills of the new world of steam engineering. Even their spiritual needs were catered for by the company, who built this church beside the works. The children were not neglected either. They were educated in this school, again provided by the Great Western Railway. So yeah, if, so yeah the Great Western Railway pretty much, pretty much went on to own Swindon. <laughs> Guys, how would you feel if your ta if the town you lived in was owned by the local railway company? How would you feel if the town you lived in was basically owned by the local railway company? Cozy Audi, and Cossidy, the 4700. it's not difficult oh, to invade by the Great Western Railway. Actually, Cozy and Cossidy, it's not difficult to imagine what life was like in this close-knit community. Yeah, indeed, James. One of the houses has been restored by the Swindon Village Trust exactly as it would have appeared around the turn of the century. It was home for a foreman from the Loco Works and his family. 1938. Well, yes, it was a uh, neon, but it, I, it provided a model for the health service. Why would, why would living in a town owned by a railway company be scary, Victor? Not because it's a railway company... Just because just any company owning your town would be scary. Yeah, I understand. Well, Swindon... Well, the GWR didn't necessarily own Swindon. The GWR didn't necessarily own Swindon. Um, they just built a lot of the new facilities. They basically just turned village uh, Swindon from a village into a town. Village trust, exactly as it would have appeared around the turn of the century. Film videos from my channel... It was I'd home. move away. <laughs> Why? I thought you liked train stand. I personally wouldn't mind living in a town owned by a railway company. One of the houses has been restored by the Swindon Village Trust exactly as it would have appeared around the turn of the century. Uh, no, not now, Levco. It was home for a foreman from the loco work. After this, I'm going to move on to talking about what the Great Western Railway became after it was... The, the, the entire system was re-gauged from 7 foot to 4 foot 8 and a half inch standard gauge. All the fantastic locomotives that were built after that time. Books and his family. Everything would be GWR branded. <laughs> Very lovely house. It may be small, but it's lovely. Would you guys like to live in a house like this? In a in a beautiful, quaint house like this? Because I would. Very cute. Oh, a porcelain dog as well. We will eventually talk about... Will we eventually... Yeah, I suppose. We'll talk about some of the freight locomotives that ran the GWR. The, um, the 280 tank and tender engines. Especially the 2800 class. It is a very nice house. It's very cute. Would anyone else here... Oh, too quaint for your liking. What about you, Victor? Would you like to live in a house like... Oh, oh, I, you've already answered. Not much that... You're much into the old school look? All oh, right, well... I'm into a lot of old school things. Rather than in the house, completely fair, John Murray. Right now it goes on to talk about the, the tea. 
break. The tea break that happened on the line. We had a Swindon tea In the rooms. 1840s, as in the days of stage... Uh, Victor, out of curiosity... Out of curiosity, Victor, I know you've been to the cafe Odd works at, but out of curiosity, is it anything like this? Like what's being shown here? You are British, Neon. I know that because you've told me you live in West Yorkshire. In the 1840s, as in the days of stagecoach oh, travel, Stan. railway journeys were punctuated by stops for refreshment. Catering facilities were set up on the station at Swindon. Yeah. yeah, the Swindon Refreshment Room has its own particular niche in Great Western Railway history. Being a convenient place midway on the line, it was the ideal site for the setting up of refreshment rooms. Oh, it's nothing like that. Oh. So the, the tables and chairs aren't like that and the walls aren't like that. Been to a few cafes. They all right? All right. That's an offensive amount of yellow. Oh. Yeah, it's a very 80s look, that, because this documentary is from the As 80s. As in the days of stagecoach travel, railway journeys were punctuated by stops for refreshment. Catering facilities were set up on the station at Swindon. Yeah, so would I, Jacob. Yeah, the Swindon Refreshment Room has its own particular niche in Great Western Railway history. Yeah, yeah I put sugar in my tea if I drank tea, but I don't. I prefer to drink coffee, as you all know. Room has its own particular niche in Great Western Railway history. That is a big sugar packet, though. Be a convenient place midway on the line. It was. The uh, no, uh, sir. I think it, it Swindon was not midway between London and Bristol. I think you'll find that Swindon was actually two thirds of the way on the line between London and Bristol. So if you do it, my, if I measure it with my fingers between Bristol and Swindon, and then do Bristol Swindon to Reading and then Reading to London, you'll see it's exactly it can be divided into exact thirds. So London to Reading, Reading to Swindon, Swindon to Bristol, it can be divided into exact thirds. I'm sorry, yeah, I'm sorry, sir, but Swindon is not midway on the line. I think you'll find that the actual midway point was Didcot. Be a convenient place midway on the Put line. Milk in the the water. Side the setting up of refreshment rooms. The proprietors yeah. of the refreshment yeah, rooms. Yeah, it was nice refreshment rooms, rooms either be way. Be a convenient place midway on the line. It was the ideal site for the setting up of refreshment rooms. The proprietors of the refreshment room secured with the Great Western a contract which would be the envy of any such proprietor today. They had built into their contract a clause requiring the Great Western Railway to stop all trains at Swindon for at least 10 minutes. Yeah, I just said that. The refreshment rooms happy. opened with the line in 18... Oh, those are very lavish! It looked very lavish when it first opened. I'd love to have gone in there. What the about the rest of catering? You? But as with most monopoly situations, things rapidly went from bad to worse. And it's not until 1895 that the Great Western Railway was able to rid itself of the Swindon embarrassment by purchasing out the rights of the proprietors. Sand in his mark. <laughs> and it's not until 1895 that the Great Western Railway was able to rid itself of the Swindon embarrassment by purchasing out the rights of the proprietors for the then prodigious sum of £100,000. With the abolition of the Swindon stop, of course, Great Western Railway speeds from London to Bristol improved out of all measure. And so all the catering. Early day. Oh yeah, I'm just going to fast forward quickly. So where he is now is the original terminus at Bristol that the GWR built. Nowadays, Bristol has a much larger Temple Mead station. That allowed for a through route. But if you look on the map here, you'll see. If you look on the map here, you'll see that the original Temple Mead station was just two platforms. You can see where the original track alignment used to go. And the original Temple Mead station, that was originally just two platforms, is adjacent to the current one. Storing the buildings to their former glory. I went along to talk to Paul Simon about it. Yeah, All this. Right. It's just oh, that's very grand. Very grand station. You still there, Victor? 
It is, I mean, it's a complete accident. Even Brunel, with his great foresight, uh, didn't see the total potential for the railway network in the southwest, and he built a terminus. Uh, it very quickly became established that the railway, having arrived from London, would need to go on down into the southwest, back into Wales, back up to the Midlands. Also, so Vince, you're going to ask God if he's going to come, because I thought he would have shown up by now. And he built a terminus. Uh, it very quickly became established that the railway, having arrived from London, would need to go on down into the southwest, back into Wales, back up to the Midlands. Wales, and so the West through Midlands. station, which we all now know as Temple Meads, was constructed. So his early terminus, although a magnificent building in itself, became redundant fairly soon in its, uh, its life. Fortunately, the building as we see it now is very much as Brunel would have designed it and built it. Although, at the moment, being here in his also great no. engine shed... All right, we're fine, we'll wait for him to come. We will, we will patiently wait for Brunel him to show would have up. Designed it and built it. Although, at the moment, being here in his great engine shed, we're actually stood on the platform that the Midland Railway Company put in in the 1870s. We're actually stood on the position of a pair of broad gauge tracks which are on what is the arrival side of the station, where the London... Uh, you have to ask me to on what is the arrival side of the station, where the London mm -hmm. uh, locomotives and engines would have uh, come in. So they'd have come into here for water, turning, fire cleaning, that sort Yes, of yes, just ahead of us, the locomotives would have uh, been detached from the carriages, and the locomotives would have come up light, up in, right into the top corner behind us there, where the great water tower still stands, and they would have taken on water before switching on the sector plate and reversing out of the station immediately ahead of us. Oh, usually they do it outside the station, but all right. So yeah, if and that black and white photo shows what a traditional Great Western train would have looked like. And so the railway opened up the West Country. From Bristol, the Bristol and Exeter Railway took the network into Devon. From Exeter, the South Devon Railway took the line over the southern fringe of Dartmoor into Plymouth. Beyond Plymouth, the Cornwall Railway crossed the River Tamar by Brunel's last great work, the Royal Albert Bridge at Saltash. Saltash. Still there, Neon? By now, Brunel was in failing health, worn out by years of overwork. Enthusiastic as he was, even his last reserves of energy, good humour and fortitude were running out. In 1859, after months of struggle, he finally launched his monster steamship, the Great Eastern, into the Thames at Millwall. But he collapsed on board and was carried home. Yeah, steamship. Brunel was known for more than just railways. Great Eastern, into the Thames other engineering Millwall. projects. But he collapsed on board and was carried home. He was just 53 years old. And on September the 15th, 1859, he died. Yep, he died on September 15th, 1859, age 53. Relatively young, he died relatively young due to all that overwork. He's buried here in the family plot at Kensal Green Cemetery. Within sound, Rest not in sight, peace. of the Great Western Railway. Yeah, we might we might talk about the Brunel steamships a little later. Not sight of the Great Western Railway. Brunel was right. gone. But the Great Western Railway went on from strength to strength, and momentous changes were on the way. That's the end of part one. Technically, it is the end of part one of this stream as well, because it's nearly um, it's nearly half past eight UK time. We're nearly at the end of uh, all right, MRP fan. Nearly halfway through, so technically, this is the end of part one. We'll leave this uh, documentary open because I want to come back to it for the Great Western Railway's later achievements. I need to go quickly go to the toilet again, but then when I come back, we'll talk about the Great Western Railway's later years from 1892. When I come back, we'll talk about the Great Western Railway's later years from... Uh, yeah, still there, Neon. When I come back, we'll talk about the Great Western Railway's later years from 1892 up to 1948 when it was nationalised into British Rail. Yeah, from 1892 when it became standard gauge up to 1948. That was a really great... 1892 to 1948 was a fantastic era for the Great Western Railway. Some of the best 
British steam locomotives ever built were, were built during that time by George Jackson Church Wood and um, Charles Collett. And we'll talk about all of the and we'll talk about a good number of those fantastic locomotive designs when I come back. Just going to get some more water, go to the loo, and then we'll get into that subject. I'll be back, guys. Okay, I'm back. What's been going on in the chat? Oh, I see Jacob's been spamming pizza slice emojis. And hello, Felix. Yeah, it was stroke, right. Still there, Victor? Okay, so now that's out of the way. The next person I'd like to talk about. Okay, it seems like Neon hasn't responded, so it looks like he's disappeared. So the next thing I want to talk about is this man. George Jackson Churchward. I don't mean yes. The chief mechanical engineer of the Great Western Railway. Oh, you're away. All oh, right. I asked if you were still around. So George Jackson Churchward and C.B. Collett were considered among the greatest railway engineers, railway locomotive engineers of the day. So now we're getting into the actual Big Four era of the, um, of this of the GWR, what these streams are actually about. Brunel briefly in my Titanic stream tomorrow? Great. Return, I agree, Levko, I agree. Okay. So this man right here, George Jackson Churchwood, he was a perfectionist. He wanted to build the best possible locomotives imaginable. He began the standardization process. He began the standardization process of building efficient locomotive designs. The 3700 City Class was arguably his biggest contribution. His most notable contribution. He built City of Truro, an engine which allegedly ran at 102 miles an hour, but I don't really believe that, because I don't really believe that this kind of engine would be capable of 100, although I know James believes it. Played in Titanic Story 2? Fantastic. I think I knew that, James. But yeah, what does everyone think of um, George Jackson Churchwood's designs? Including Victor. But yeah, this was arguably Churchwood's greatest, um, most notable contribution. The City Class. The 3700 City Class. He also built a few experimental 460s. James is gullible. 
Uh, I'll just briefly, how are we doing in terms of views? Oh, only 107, okay. Not a bad engine, I agree. What about you, Victor? What do you think? My fav- but my favourite of Churchwood's designs, in my opinion, is the 2800 class. The Churchwood's 280 freight locomotives with tenders. So yes, Stan, I told you we'd get on to talking about freight transportation for the Great Western Railway. Okay, Victor may have disappeared. He hasn't answered me. Oh, wait, 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 wait. He may... Wait, he did answer me. He might, um... He might just be taking a while to turn. That's a train, I know. But what do you think of the train itself? Is what I'm asking. Yeah, but, but as I said, my favourite of Churchwood's designs would have to be the 2800s freight locomotives pulling mixed... They pulled... Mixed semi-fast and express freight trains, the 2800s. They are incredible locomotives. And five of them are still around today. I've been pulled by a miniature version of the 2800s. I've been pulled by a miniature 2800 on the Eastbourne Miniature Railway. Don't think I've been pulled by a full-size one, though. Into the Sith. Okay. Oh, we even built some French designs, Churchwood. I never knew that. Hmm. It's kind of train shaped and rather train esque. I'll give it a banana squash out of octopus. Ay, ay, ay. And these engines were the predecessors to the prairies. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> there weren't many Pacifics built. The Great Western Railway didn't build many Pacific locomotives. This is one of the few they built, the Great Bear. Mainly they stuck to 460 locomotives. Uh, I know Stan wanted me to wanted wanted me to talk about the freight hauling side of the Great Western Railway, so I'll just show you all some twenty eight one of the preserved twenty some some of the preserved twenty eight hundreds locomotives in action so that Stan can see them. So yeah, there's five of these 2800s still around. Oh yeah, the Great Western's locomotives also had two-tone whistles. I'll go into more detail about that later. So here you are, Stan, a 2800 pulling freight trains. Prefer the Dean Goods? Oh, you want to see a Dean Goods in action? All right. Hang on. The curve of the 101 class. Okay. But yeah, in terms of freight traffic, the Great Western Railway handled things like um, coal from the um, from the coal pit in Wales, and also like. Oil, oil down to like ten down to Cornwall, I believe, like to a uh, Penzance. Station's 
Oh, it doesn't run, does it? Oh, so I won't be able to show you it running anyway. But yeah, this is the best thing I can show you in terms of GWR freight trains. 2800 pulling a freight train. Churchwood 2800 pulling a mixed freight train. Oh yeah, and the GWR also served a lot of the rural, like, farming areas and things. Putting grain things. Pretty much Pacer chassis. Alright. Here we are, 2800 running fast along here now. Uh, like, maybe like, not so much, not necessarily just LNER engines, but maybe like, um, why did you say that, Neon? Maybe just like, um, worn out joints, maybe. Oh, that is a wonderful sight, wouldn't you say, guys? Oh yeah, and there's two brake vans as well, the toad brake vans. Just as the steam train passes underneath, I haven't experienced that either. Pounding its way uphill. It's even, there's even a gunpowder wagon on that train. So do I, James. Oh, we got one pounding up the line here. Oh yeah, and chocolate and cream became, the chocolate and cream livery became synonymous with the Great Western Railway. Are you still there, Victor? Number 2758. There's also the stars. He also designed the stars and the Granges. So outranged. Heavy trains of coal for South Wales. Oh, a few more were built around World War Two. Bone rattlers operated in Dan, all right. That is enlightening. But yeah, the 2800s engines that are preserved are numbers 2807, 2818, 2857, which we've just seen in action, 2859, and 2874, which is currently under restoration from very scrapyard condition. A number 2873 is technically also preserved. But it's being used as spares as a parts donor engine. So yeah, George Jackson Churchwood designed a great range of locomotives. Oh, whoops, oh, I didn't mean to close the Wikipedia page. Yeah, I understand, um... Neon. That's not relevant to the stream, Felix. Right! So, George Jackson Churchwood died in um, 
ni on the 19th of December, 1933, and he actually died in a very amusing way. Yeah, Churchwood died in a very amusing way, and very fitting for a railway engineer. He noticed a loose piece of rail, and he so he went to inspect it, but as he was doing so, he was run over by the Paddington to Fishguard Express and was killed. So yeah, pretty fitting way to go for a locomotive engineer, wouldn't you say, guys? Literally getting run over by a train. <laughs> Wouldn't you agree, guys? Wouldn't you agree, Victor? How is death funny, Mr. Funny Twat? I don't know. It's just a it's just a fitting way for a locomotive engineer to go, in my opinion. Getting literally getting run over by a train. <laughs> Ironic and tragic? Exactly, Neon. That should have been on stupid- Yes! I completely agree! I, I literally don't know why it wasn't, um... I literally don't know why it wasn't, James. Stupid. Why wasn't it? Hope next time it's not you. <laughs> Nurse George. Um, murdered. Stranded. Method of death. <laughs> but yeah, what do you think of that, Victor? A, a guy who worked with trains in the past dying literally by being run over by a train but anyway churchwood retired like 11 years before then and he was succeeded okay here's a list of all the engines that churchwood designed so he retired in 1922 so these are all the engines he designed Well, yeah, it's sad. Of course it's sad, but a fitting way to go for, um... A fitting way to go for a locomotive engineer, wouldn't you say? I mean, everyone dies eventually. But my favourites of the Great Western Railway's chief mechanical engineers would unquestionably have to be Charles Benjamin Comet. George Mac George Church Jackson Churchwood is is seen as George Jackson Churchwood is seen as the greatest of the GWL's chief mechanical engineers. But my favourite is Charles Collett. Souls don't die. No. He designed, Collett designed my favourite um, Great Western Railway locomotives, including the Castle class. I'm going to briefly show you another little part of um, another Mark Williams on the rails episode. Ah. Uh. Designing trains. French! He learned to use steam at 220. Berkeley Castle is a murderer then? I guess. This Lockland's. Ha ha! Locomotive engineers were proud men from a proud tradition, and they wanted to work for the best. By the time of the grouping in 1922, when the big four companies were formed to rationalise the railway system, the GWR was the best. Their locos Indeed. were the yardstick that all others were judged by. With designs way ahead of the competition, the GWR became affectionately known as God's Wonderful Railway. 
God's wonderful rally. <laughs> Hilarious. I wonder where Electro is. And this is one of those fine designs. Earl Bathurst. Built in 1923, one year after the grouping. The grouping actually happened in 1923 on the 1st of January. One year after the grouping. All locomotives have evolved through generations of in-service experience, and that was particularly the case with the GWR, Thank with an unbroken lineage of engineering oh, sorry, excellence Lanco. from Eisenbach, King de Brunel, through Daniel Gooch to Church Ward. He pronounced it incorrectly just briefly. designed that loco. Speaking from... It's a castle class. Yeah, my favourite. Spoken of by enthusiasts in hushed tones. My favourite GWR engine. George Churchwood was a perfectionist, an engineer with an incredible eye for detail. And in this age of great rivalry, attention to detail was what kept you ahead of the competition. Churchwood was an engineer who learnt from practices in other countries and from the French. He learned to use steam at 225 pounds per square inch, 25 pounds more than was current practice. He also learned to use four cylinders, driving each of the first two axles, giving a much smoother and balanced ride. Castle classes are your second favorite GWR engines? Great. Are the castle classes among your favorite tender engines, Stan? Giving a much smoother and balanced ride. They're my favorite GWR engines. No, Neon, it was actually a hall class. But but they actually look very similar to each other, the halls, the castles, and all, all those other engines. I'll get into that. It's all to do with the standardization. Welcome back, Jupiter. At the vast GWR Loco Works in Swindon, Church Ward's policy of constant steam improvement meant that his men. Oh, I had really to did think Odd would be here by now. At the vast Stop. GWR Loco Works in Swindon, Church Ward's policy of constant steam improvement meant that his men had to undertake new and demanding challenges. Churchward's personality, the way he dealt yes. with his men, and his constant hands-on approach meant that he could institute real improvements. Take his ideas on tapered boilers, for instance. In case you were wondering, normal boilers are parallel. But this has a flared end. There is more area available for heating at the firebox end. Plus, because of that flare, you have a natural point. A high All right, point. you're going to come back, Tony. This has a flared end. There is no Hell class. Area available for heating at the firebox end. Plus, because of that flare, you have a natural point, a high point, that can collect your steam. Also, it's cooler at the thinner end, so you have a natural tendency of the water to circulate. Once again, creating more efficiency. It's very clever. Yes. Right. Steaming becomes more efficient. Small gains found over years of trial and error improved the breed. Churchwood died at the age of 76. Retired, yet still fired with a passion for railways, he stepped onto the track to examine a loose rail and was hit by the Paddington to Fishguard Express. Break on! Ironically, it was being pulled by the Barclay Castle, a development of one of his own designs. His successor was one Charles Collett. Here we go, Mr. Collett. He designed the GWR's four most iconic 460 passenger locomotives. The castles, the kings, the halls, and the manors. All four being fantastic engines. Still there, Victor? Collett's big contribution to the GWR was to complete the standardization program begun under Churchwood. Yeah. By the 20th century, the locomotive works had started using electrically powered drilling machines and presses. Collett could see that if the engines were built with precision, 
they could be serviced with standard parts straight off the shelf. Yeah, exactly. The result? That's why, that's why a lot of Great Western Railway locomotives designed during the Churchwood and Collet eras, that's why a, a good a good number of them look the same. Because of the whole standardization thing and being serviced with off the shelf parts, um because they were all serviced with off the shelf parts. Um, yeah, because they were all serviced with off the shelf parts. Um, oh, I've got, I've lost my. Because they were all serviced with off the shelf parts. Good number of them, despite being of different classes, look very, very similar. So a castle, a king, and a hall. The average non-railway enthusiast would not be able to tell a castle class, a king class, and a hall class apart. It takes a very, very trained enthusiast's eye to tell the difference. Machines and presses. Collett could see that if the engines were built with precision, they could be serviced with standard parts straight off the shelf. The result would be more efficiency, reliability, and economy. Exactly. Science was the answer to standardization, but the problems are huge. Exactly, that. It's code. symmetrical. A locomotive. You've got two sets of everything. And along this huge length, with one, two, three, four, Five axles. The possibilities for deviation are huge. Everything has to be measured up. Everything has to be aligned. It's no good doing it with string and eyes. The GWR turned to Zeiss and bought in optical measuring equipment to get everything correct. Correct. Collett had scored another resounding success for the GWR. Now their engines were even more efficient. With their incredible speed and punctuality. Oh, there you are, Art. <laughs> Actually, it is. It is. It is Ron Weasley's dad. Mark Williams was, um... Did indeed play Arthur Weasley. You might remember him from the Narrow Gauge stream. You might remember him from the Narrow Gauge stream. Graham is saying it's called more Bob over during the construction montage. What's this? Hey, guys. <laughs> top five trains. Today we have a list I've of seen, top five trains. Number five. I've seen this. Go off your train. Damn, I've Daniel. seen this. Number four. I thought you would have seen this. Train. You were the one who introduced me to this channel. Yeah, you might remember Mark Williams from the, um, yeah, or do you might remember Mark Williams from the Narrow Gauge Railway stream? Everything correct. Collett had scored another resounding success for the GWR. Now their engines were even more efficient. With their incredible speed and punctuality, they were leaving the other three companies standing. The GWR's engineering excellence gave that. it locos that could pull its named trains, like the Cheltenham Flyer. And the Cornish Riviera Express. In 1929, the fastest scheduled steam service in the world, averaging speeds of 75 miles per hour between Cheltenham and Paddington. And they did so with remarkable economy. Producing 9.9 .9 pounds of steam for every pound of coal. And that was a statistic that was never equaled by any of the other big four companies. Yeah. Still there? Oh, oh yes. That is. Yeah, those are the... Yeah, I said that a lot of GWR engines had two whistles, and we'll talk about that a little later. It wasn't just the engineering that mattered. 
British designers always made a great effort with the appearance of their locos. You don't have to be a locomotive connoisseur to appreciate a car class. Did you hear that, Odden Victor? You don't have to be a locomotive connoisseur to appreciate a castle class. You don't have... So what it... Translation, you don't have to be a railway enthusiast to appreciate a castle class locomotive. They are beautifully proportioned. Oh, you haven't even been at work, have you, Ards? It's got lots of Victorian touches still. The brass safety valve bonnet. Brass safety valve. These brass lined wheel plashers. But underneath all that is the most modern locomotive of the big four companies. I am the worst the work. set standards that other engineers tried to match. They were much admired for their efficiency, but more importantly for their speed, because... Yes, speed. Um... Yeah, speed always matters, and the castles were capable of 100 miles an hour. Not that, oh, oh, I see. Work as in, um, work as in video work. All right. But yes, uh, hang on, uh, open image in new tab. You don't have to be a locomotive connoisseur you don't have to be a train enthusiast to appreciate a great western railway castle class locomotive so do you appreciate this engine this, this locomotive design odd and victor do you think it's beautiful because i do and what williams just said is about you don't have to be a locomotive connoisseur to appreciate locomotives is why I keep asking you about certain steam locomotive designs. You're lazy. You're off to bed? Okay, Jacob, thanks for coming. I've done my part. All oh, right. <laughs> You're working on videos. Oh, you don't think it's beautiful. You just don't... <laughs> you just think it looks like a normal train. Same wavelength. Accidentally, it suddenly cuts to a stupid <laughs> sketch. Oh my god. <laughs> I don't care what Ron. Welcome, Martin. I don't care what Juan Weasley's dad has to say. <laughs> okay. You found the, um. But you found the, um. Oh. You found the double fairly narrow gauge locomotives interesting, though, aren't Five seven four three, the Flying Scotsman. No, it's Earl of Mount Edgecombe. This one is Earl of Mount Edgecombe. Which one was what? Uh, odd. Oh, street. That was stream number one hundred and twenty-five. Odds. The one that you said looked like a. Looked like a shingle back, you know, the one with, um, that looked like two heads. Oh, calm down, Martin. Featuring the original actor that played death in horrible histories. <laughs> Jesus, Martin. <laughs> calm down. You just, you just think it just looks like a normal, you just think this design looks like a normal train, do you? No, it's not. It's Earl of Mount Edgecombe. So, does it just look like a normal train to you, Gart, to... So, does this just look like a normal train to you two, Odd and Victor? As I understand, in that case. Speed captures the public oh, the two-headed mofo. Yep. Speed sells tickets. Me like lizard. All oh, right. So, it's not like lizard trains. <laughs> Yeah, lizard trains. 
Speed sells tickets. Yeah, it does. No, all of you. And, no, in my eyes, anyone who anyone who can be bothered to chat in this stream in these streams are the main characters. You're a main character. I'll pay extra. The LMS, the LNER, and the Southern Railway were just no match for the mighty GWR. Well, even if you two don't think that the Castle Class locomotives and the other ones designed by Charles Collett are beautiful, Lord and Victor, I certainly do, being a train enthusiast. France summed up the situation in December 1929. It is not easy to find a reason, other than inertia, for the failure of most of our railways to improve the speed of passenger trains in the last quarter of a century. What the Great Western can do many times a day, all through the year, should be possible on some of the other lines. But do you at the very least remember Mark Williams from the Narrow Gauge Stream, or do you remember this man from the Narrow Gauge Stream? The focus had shifted. The competition was no longer all about reliability you, and punctuality. As it was are now you. About speed. An epic battle was about to be fought. The fight to run Britain's fastest passenger train. He was reading, he was reading some sort of quote, um, odd. Okay, the rest of this episode, the re okay, the rest of this episode covers the other, um, big four locomotive com uh, train companies, so we'll come back to the other parts of this episode in the later GWR streams. I remember that he is Ron Weasley's dad, oh yeah. <laughs> Well now, Odd, now I want to show you some of a few parts of the Mark Williams on the Rails episode we watched um, earlier, as you missed it. Just the, I'm just going to skim through it, just the key parts of it. Or whatever, on the train and make it fly. Is he stupid? I don't know. Expelling, I don't know. No, no, to make it fly, he needs to use Wingardium Leviosa. Expelliarmus is the, is the disarming charm. I don't know much about Harry Potter, and even I know a few of the spells. At the beginning of the night... Yeah, I just want to quickly show you what you missed, Odd, about the actual construction of the original Bristol to London Great Western Railway. You remember last week I told you about... I told you about Isambard Kingdom Brunel, Odd. Oh, really, James? I never knew that. 31, two years previously, the brilliant young engineer had won a competition. He had beaten the great... So he'd won a competition to design a suspension bridge in Bristol. To assume... Oh, it's all right. Over the Avon Gorge, 214 metres wide and 75 metres deep, Brunel's design was for a single span... Suspension bridge. The I don't know what you're on Suspension about, bridge. What do you think of one of Brunel's earliest creations that's being shown right here, Rods? The Clifton Suspension Bridge. It's not a railway bridge, it's a road bridge. What do you think of it? <coughs> this was built all the way back in 1831. <laughs> it's incredible that something like that was built in 1831. <laughs> The technology and know-how to build big suspension bridges worry, have been John around Murray, nearly a hundred coming. years. We'll next week. But Brunel's design was on such a grandiose scale that it required some very careful calculations. The competition rules stated a maximum load on the supporting chains of five and a half tons per square inch of chain. Brunel worked out a design that would place a load of only four tons per square inch. His nearest That's rival nice. was more than six We should build bridges between people. <laughs> All right. He ends up with this absolutely perfectly balanced suspension bridge. And every time a vehicle goes...
Because if you... Well, if you like the looks of bridges, I don't get why you don't care as much for the looks of trains. Goodbye, Levco. As Thanks across the bridge, you can see it's absolutely perfectly balanced. Look. It floats above the Avon Gorge. Yeah, a mathematical masterpiece. It was a mathematical masterpiece and let Bristol know that Brunel could tackle difficult Gorge. engineering problems and come up with radical results. They had in their engineer the right man in the right place at the right time. In 18... And then he was commissioned to build the Great Western Railway in 1833. 19... He's in coach and on horseback, long searching for elusive assistance, horseback. and long nights in inns, poring over maps and estimates. He confessed to a friend, Between ourselves, it is harder work than I like. I'm rarely much under 20 hours a day at it. 20 hours a day? Odd would you be able to work? <coughs> bridge is a bridge, a train is a train, a boat is a plane if you try hard enough. All right. <laughs> Would you be able to work 20 hours a day, Odden Victor? Brunel was an unbelievably hard worker. Yeah, Brunel was an unbelievably hard worker. 20 hours a day. From the moment he woke up to the moment he went to sleep. It took him nearly two years to complete his plans. The hills and rivers he plotted all posed major headaches for his dream of providing the fastest, smoothest railway Eight to ten possible. hours at most? Yeah, I know. Most, most, no, I wouldn't be able to work 20 hours a day either. No way in hell. Most I'd be able to work with in, like, the film industry would be, like, 12 hours a day. Bruno decided on the... Well, it was his choice, Victor. Flattest his choice to work that long. Possible route from Bristol to London. So Brunel wanted the flattest possible route from railway route from Bristol to London, which makes complete sense. And south east of Bath, then on to Reading and London, giving him a gradient of rarely more than three metres per mile. On his railway, Brunel wanted the tracks to be built as level as possible. The more inclines, the slower the journey would be, and the more fuel his engines would use. Yes. Yeah. Makes complete sense. Although he had completed his plans by November 1833, it wasn't until the last day of August 1835 that the bill to build the Bristol to London line received royal assent. After some epic parliamentary battles, an expense was a grueling. So yeah, it was a very, very clever man and. As I said, as I told you on, on Twitter, Rod, Br Brunel was also very likely autistic, examination. like myself. Oh, and this next bit I think you should find very interesting. The type of track gauge Brunel used when he first built the Great Western Railway. So if you remember from the street, from the narrow gauge stream, Rod, track gauge refers to how far apart the rails are from each other. So narrow gauge is like... The rails are very close together, but Brunel wanted what to do Brunel the complete opposite. What Brunel didn't say to the parliamentary committees was to prove his genius. In the new railway Still act, he hand? hadn't mentioned the type of gauge he was going to use. He was ready to put forward his big idea. Brunel wanted to build the fastest, smoothest railway in the country. And just because George Stevenson oh, had are. started using a gauge of four foot eight and a half inches well, you didn't mean low. that all railways oh, damn, had to be built Stan. to that dimension. So, Brunel chose a broad gauge. Broad gauge. Seven feet that from rail broad, to rail. Broad gauge is the opposite of narrow gauge. That and you can tell Mr. Williams is a tall boy because he fits completely within the seven foot a track gauge. In scale. It meant he could have bigger locos. They could be faster. Are you coming? I am. He could have bigger carriages. It would be bigger, better, very exciting, a lot less normal. Yes, so very, very wide trains. Basically, 
the Great Western Railway's original trains were the tr train equivalent of the What is Putin meme. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard of that meme, Oz, and in a moment I'll show you some clips of the, um... In a moment I'll show you some clips. How tall is he? Well, as he, um, well, as he, um, takes up the entire width of the track, I reckon he's, um, he's like seven feet tall. All right then, James. So yeah, trains that are the equivalent of the wide Putin meme. So I, I remember you commented on how the narrow gauge trains got the shark treatment odd. Well, for this, um, well, for this, um, for the Great Western Railway originally, it was um, the opposite. Yeah, you said that. What was his name again? Mark Williams. It would be bigger, better, very exciting, a lot less northern. So yeah, Br so yeah, Brunel's logic was wider trains with bigger driving wheels would mean Dipsy's Tipsy, yes. <laughs> Wider trains with bigger driving wheels would mean a lower center of gravity, they'd be more aerodynamic, there'd be more traction and less friction, enabling the trains to go faster, and because they were wider, they would also allow for much bigger passenger and freight capacity. Does that make, does that make sense to you, Odd? Does... Brunel's logic makes sense to you, Odd, why he wanted to build much bigger trains. He's 6'1", three inches shorter than me. Right. Using his charm, okay. Brunel soon convinced his backers that his broad oh, tracks would just, work. Did you go he surveyed his route, did he decided on his up? gauge, and everything seemed to be in place for him to start building the Great Western Railway. But it was... Yeah, forge his yeah, Bristol so, so the terminus at Paddington. London route. It was hard, back-breaking work, the and his wide it. lines caused total devastation to the surrounding countryside. So back in the 1830s, there was no heavy machinery. Objects of this size. No, no civil precedence for civil engineering projects apart Without from the heavy machinery like this. Brizzy proving I was taller to make myself feel better. Oh, all right. Now needed some real muscle to take on the challenge of building his line. Navvies were employed, many of whom hadn't built railways before. Yeah, mainly using because there hadn't been many to railways dig up the to track build. bed and lay it down. Yeah, they used pickaxes to dig up the track bed and lay down the ballast. Would you be able to do such manual tasks, Odd? If you worked in the construction industry, would you be able to shift as much soil as a modern-day digger could? Do you reckon you'd be able to shift as much soil in one day as a modern-day digger could if you worked as a construction worker in the 1830s? Here's a quote. Whitney, today. It was hairy and brown. Same co complexation as him too. A navvy, given good conditions, could dig a trench Easy, three feet much wide, easier than three them. feet deep, <laughs> and what 36 feet long in one day. And lift it all above his head. Dig a trench three feet wide, three feet deep, and 36 feet long in one day. Very cool and buff. As the navvies cleared the way for Brunel's broad lines, parts of the railway were starting to take shape. But he was about to hit the first major construction problem that could destroy his iron road to London. You on a coffee break every five minutes. Oh, this next part is, I always found to be the most interesting part of the Great Western Railway's construction odds. However careful you are about avoiding obstacles, 
and Brunel's Great Western Railway was often jokingly referred to as the Great Way Round. Sooner or later in the United Kingdom, you come across a major obstacle. And this was Brunel's Box Hill. Couldn't go over it, had to go through it. The normal method, followed by canal and railway engineers, was to keep your bore as small as possible. But that wasn't Brunel's way. He was going to drive two seven-foot broad gauge lines through this hill. This is Box Tunnel, and nearly two miles long. It was the greatest railway tunnel ever attempted, and an infamous piece of engineering, if ever there was one. It couldn't be dug out, it had to be blasted. Brunel's yeah, navvies were forging his iron down. road across the south of England. The work was gruelling, and in places like Box Tunnel, it was also extremely dangerous. Tunnels would sand their ground, looking for fractures. Yeah, it was extremely dangerous digging out Box Tunnel. Hundreds died in the construction of Box Tunnel odds. Apparently, in percentage terms, you were more likely to die blasting out Box Tunnel than you were um, in the trenches during World War One. What do you think about that? There's one. So, that's going to come down very easily. Then after you've drilled your hole, you prepare to set your charge. They would have been using black powder, gunpowder. Gun powder. For the purposes of demonstration, this will rep represent dynamite. Dynamite. <laughs> I just so, love his... The black West powder would have been fed into the hole. And there. then, just like a gun, a muzzle-loading gun on a, on a Napoleonic ship, it would have had a wad behind it. So if we pretend that's and our batters, What does that mean, charge, Stan? And this... Got a tamping rod here. Oh, emphasis. Wood, no sparks. And then you would have tamped the charge home. If the rock hadn't already fallen on you, and by the time you drilled this, you hadn't put any more down, this was probably the most dangerous yeah, like portion of the now. job yet, because this. Yes. Yeah. What do you think of that statistic of being more likely to die digging this railway tunnel than in the trenches in World War One? The gang is calling. Oh, oh, all red. You know what? In that case, I'll leave this open, and you guys will. I'll, I'll explain the rest of the construction of Box Tunnel and all the blasting and how dangerous it was. How all that was involved when you come back. You gonna you gonna be back later though, once you're done with that call? You gonna be back later? I'll leave this open for you when you come back. I'll leave this open for you when you come back. For when you come back. And I Yeah, I'll leave this open for you for when you come back. Right, so in the meantime, I guess we'll drive some Great Western Railway locomotives. Some Great Western, we'll drive a bit of Great Western Railway along Roblox. This one looks good. Tiny for GWR engines. Look how small these guys are. <laughs> oh my god. They're like those Pez models from Thomas. Look at them. Oh, that's the respawn one. Where's the points? Oh, 
Oh, here's, here's the point levers. Oh, come on. Change these goddamn things. Why won't these points change? Try to win the war of speed. I will talk about that in the upcoming stream. Okay, this isn't very good because there aren't any working points. Great. Western Railway. Oh, there are some great Western locomotives on the Tailand Railway. Watch out, I've gone offline. There are some great Western locomotives on the Tailand Railway, so... Guess we'll go on to here. Oh, actually, first things first, I need the loo again. First things first, I'm going to go to the loo again. Before I find one of the GWR engines. Just going to be back in a moment, guys. Oh, there you are, Electro. Just in time. Oh, yes. I'm wondering where you were. So where have you been, Electro? Have you been working on your latest drawing? I was actually just about to... Um, I was actually just about to go up to the toilets. Odd and Victor were here, but they, but Luna and Stingy have called them away. And Neon is playing, um, not, not to you too, Jacob. And, uh, Neon's playing Spyro Reignited at the moment. One of my favourite Roblox games. Yeah, well, I will be after I've been to the loo. Oh, you were working on your sketch of Douglas as well. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, of course. Yeah, if you were finished working on that as well, brilliant. Well, anyway, before I was just about to play some GWR um, games. Just going to let... Uh, just going to let Neon know that... Your hair. Just need the toilet again. I'll be back in a moment and then I'll get into driving sub GWR engines.
Right. Okay, I'm back. Let me just set Electro. Be doing Douglas tomorrow. Then I would do more on Scar 8 Speed, but then I'll finally have to charcoal driving Vincent. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah, you sort of love that. Anyway, uh, let's um, find that GWR. Oh, there's an austerity there for you, Stan. Hang on. Wait, no, no, don't leave. Reset character. But yeah, I was just telling everyone some a lot of information on Great Western Railway Electro. Oh my god. <laughs> what has happened here? There's 14 X there's 1400 tank engines everywhere. There's like an army of Olivers. What's going on? <laughs> what is this? Who's done this? <coughs> Who spawned all these Olivers? I'm just telling everyone the information I told you earlier. You said you wanted to learn something new, didn't you, Electro? So... Hang on. Yeah, I know, Stan. Yeah, there is a Q1 in this game. But somewhere around here, there's there's an engine shed that contains several GWR Express locomotives. Alright, there's a shed. Fuck. Hang on. I'm gonna reset character again. Oh dear. Hang on. Oh dear. Right in front. Oh, it was right in front of me. Oh. oh I'm, I'm an idiot. I'm a complete idiot. Don't leave. Welcome back, Neon. Electro has just joined us. I am trying. I'm now in the board of directors room. Oh, the teleporter, right. Uh... Teleporter GUI. Ruston. The Eclipse Stage, Jock to Champ, uh, Jasper. Nax Harbor. Oh, here we are. Yeah, here's the... Oh, my God. Who is doing this? Spawning loads of engines here. What is this? Who's doing this and why? Just want to drive some GWR engines, but this goddamn game won't let me. Yeah, it is. It's going very quickly. What is going on here? I can't even find the delete button on these engines. Have a key. Alright. Yeah, exactly. Where's the delete button on these engines? For God's sake. Who's 
seriously, who has done this? Who's messed up the engine shed like this? Like on the back of a tender. Where are the delete buttons? Oh my god. Oh, hang on, hang on. I think I just saw it. I think I just saw the delete button. It's got a little awkward playing on the keyboard. That's the game I forgot about it. Shit. All I want to do is drive this whole class locomotive, but I can't. Someone here had to mess it up for me. Some idiot in this server had to mess it up for me. You probably thought it'd be funny to spawn a load of hall classes in. No, I don't build bricks. Hello, Frido. Welcome. I, mean, I don't think we've seen you before. Please subscribe if you haven't already. And now I'm stuck in... Oh, no, I'm not. Who has done this? Seriously? Who and why? Leave for a player to clean. Some of them would. I cannot, for the life of me, find the delete button on any of these. I saw it briefly, but I don't know where it is. Claim the world? No. That would not be okay. This is the one downside to this game. What, people come here and deliberately mess things up for others? First game over, all right. You know what, I can't be bothered. There's still a lot I wanna cover in this stream, so we'll just leave Roblox. Electro, if you're still there, This is one of one of the things I was talking to you about earlier. Neon hasn't seen this yet. I was keeping this open for Odd and Victor, but they've gone off. Neon hasn't seen this yet. The, the construction of Box Tunnel and the work how was grueling. Out. And in places like Box Tunnel, it was also extremely dangerous. I don't know. Bell breaks. Tunnels would sand their ground, looking for fractures. There's one. So that's sounding their ground looking easily. for fractures, for rock fractures. Then after you drilled your hole, you prepared to set your charge. They would have been using black powder, gunpowder. For the purposes of demonstration, right, this will repre Still represent there, dynamite. 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 <laughs> so you got the black powder would have been fed into the hole. And then just like a gun, a muzzle loading gun on a, on a Napoleonic ship, it would have had a wad behind it. So if we Yes, on. Charge. 
Exactly, this. this is Mark Williams. Got a tamping rod here. Hang on a minute. This is something I didn't Wood. realize. No sparks. And then you would have tamped the charge home. If the rock hadn't already fallen on you, and by the time you drilled this, you oh, hadn't put oh, any more down, uh, this was probably the most works. dangerous portion of the job yet, because this Tandy can become rocks. a projectile. Yes, it could become a projectile. And impale another fellow worker somewhere across the, um, the, uh, yeah, it is across the tunnel. The pressure to build the railways fast meant that health and safety was never a major concern. Construction of early railway lines maimed and killed many of the brave men that built them. One of the things I used to do was use a piece of quill, slice that and add more black powder and then jam that in and then once you'd laid your charge Used a naked, naked flame, flame, another nice safety feature. Except it's not Delight a safety feature, because naked flame could ignite stray gunpowder. The function of the rubber duck? I don't know. But yeah, a lot of people died building the railways back then. Not, no, not yet, but I will at some point. But yes, those tamping rods could become project projectiles and impale other workers. Very sad. Lots of people being killed during the construction. And then, traditionally, leg it! This is exactly what I was talking to you about earlier, Electro. The primitive... The unsafe blasting methods. Then, traditionally, leg it! How fast you had to run depended on how long you'd cut your fuse. then trip on your laces. <laughs> yeah, I bet that happened to a lot of workers. I have no idea, Bill Bricks. No idea. At least 10 years, though. And ridiculous how they didn't have any form of shelter. Exactly. As you can see, that was just... That was that explosion you just saw was just a safe nitroglycerin and primer cord one. Far safer than the gunpowder ones. But yeah, that's that. Oh, I kept doing things like this because it's exciting. It is exciting. The tunnel consumed a ton of candles and a ton of gunpowder every week. A hundred horses and carts pulled the 30 million bricks to light it. Who counted them? It took five years to finish Box Tunnel, and apart from using steam pumps, to clear water and blasting powder, it was all done with muscle, men and horsepower, yes. but at a terrible cost. Muscle. Over a hundred men lost their lives, and many, many more were seriously injured and maimed. And in the days before anaesthetic, it doesn't really bear thinking about it. No, it doesn't. Bath Hospital used to resemble a field dressing station during a major battle. Brunel Over was once showed a list of 131 men. Oh, I told you this earlier as well, seriously Electro. Injured during a 20 month period. He said, I think it is a very small list considering the very heavy works and the immense amount of gunpowder used. It wasn't just the loss of life at Box Tunnel that was a problem for him. People weren't keen oh, on travelling underground either. 
After all, it was a bit closer to hell. And they thought they. But Brunel was never deterred from making big out. decisions or trying out something new. Brunel turned the accepted wisdom of how to lay a railway completely on its head. There are no transverse sleepers, which is how we imagine. That's our image of what a railway track bed looks like. There's great gaps here with ballast in here because these are the sleepers. They run longitudinally. The rails are laid on top of them. They're tied at intervals here, here, and then it's spiked every now and again with piles driven into the earth. You can see it's dual what gauge there, standard and, we, and what broad contemporary gauge. inspectors criticised was that in between the sleepers tended to sag. It was 2004, so uh, Neon, this was May. Switchback ride. But it shouldn't just be dismissed as eccentric because at the time the London and Birmingham railway was using the northern colliery method of stone sleepers and that was a very hard ride indeed. served his time in ironwork and this Electro is one of the locomotives, the original GWR exactly. locomotives, one of the broad gauge locomotives. And by his late teens, he was already a fully yeah, qualified right. broad gauge. And said, a what did like was persuade Brunel to Huge buy one of the driving wheels locomotives. There. The North Star. North Star wasn't without its teething Look, it's problems. it's a wide train. They just couldn't get the power out of it. They thought they could. So, Brunel and Gooch, who proved to be... The most pragmatic of nice. engineers worked on a new blast pipe and its improved performance amazed everybody. By increasing the size of the blast pipe and making sure that the steam discharged in the middle of the chimney, they had created an engine which could go faster using less fuel. Still there, um, it was by uh... far the most successful of the first GWR engines and Gooch used it as a prototype for a whole new broad gauge class. And this is the first of them, a replica being built at Didcot. Firefly. There were 62 in the class. They had seven foot driving wheels. On the first trial, it went from Paddington to Twyford, 31 miles at an average speed of 50 miles per hour, which was unheard of. Yeah. 50, 60 miles an hour may be a pretty normal speed today, but back then it was like light speed. On Let's June the 4th, in actually, Hems. All Brunel needed to do was just design Come a little on, bridge for his trains to cross. A simple task for an engineer who had just drawn up the plans for the grandest bridge in Bristol. Yeah. Yeah, or flat, wide arches. Yeah, Brunel Main was head. exceptionally good another bridge. Maths, They'd already got one, thank you very much on which and they science. made quite a bit of money charging tolls. And the Electro, do you see what I mean? Do you see what I mean by Brunel being a lot like you? Do you see what I mean with by Brunel being a lot like you, Electro? Being good at maths, engineering and science. Commissioners wanted to make sure that the yes, river neon. was still free for barge traffic. So, Brunel came up with what is commonly called an engineering triumph. The Maidenhead, 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 Maidenhead Viaduct. 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 Maidenhead Viaduct echoes. Because the river still had to stay open for navigation, Brunel was only allowed one pier Huge, in the centre of the river. Very, very wide now, arches. Built a traditional arch bridge with hemispherical arches, each arch would have to have been 64 feet high. No, it's Much higher than right. the bank on either side, he would have had a humped backed viaduct, not very practical for a railway. And not so very, he came up and with this Brunel's daring and simple solution. He flattened the arches. Not sure if Brunel's there. secret was in the maths. His pages of sketches are surrounded by detailed calculations. He had projected the force on every part of the bridge with great accuracy. Brunel had worked out how to design arches longer and flatter than any others built before. Each one is 128 foot wide, rising to only 24 foot in the centre. He didn't have an electronic calculator. Oh, cool, Amazingly, thanks. he worked it all out by hand. The rest of the engineering world thought that this would be Brunel's greatest failure. Doom was prophesied. Too flat, it won't stand. 
Unfortunately, when Chadwick, the contractor, removed the centering, that's the form, the wooden form that the arch was built on, from the eastern arch, this one, it, it did sag very bridge. slightly. But yeah, good. Chadwick took the blame. He said that he hadn't waited long enough for the special Roman cement to set. And of course, yeah. it's still here, and it's still a viaduct. And it's all down to Brunel's mathematical genius. His great iron he road was amazing, between London. Brunel. Electro, if you're still there, and if he isn't, Neon, could you pass this on to, on to Electro, Neon? I genuinely think that Electro could be the next Brunel. I genuinely do believe that Electro is as smart as Brunel. London and Bristol was nearing completion. I do but believe that. But at Box Hill, that. his eccentric and extravagant plans were running into problems. We were our favourite mythical beast. Supposed to be finished be awesome. by August um, 1840. By December 1840, work had fallen so far behind schedule that Brunel threw 4,000 men yeah. and 300 horses working in shifts to try and complete his missing link on his Bristol to London line. Yeah, that would be awesome. Finally Jacob, finished absolutely. in June 1841. And it marked the end of Brunel's epic eight-year struggle to build the line. No wonder he put a nice porch on the front of it. In 59, the level road, sweeping curves, high standards of design was ultimately a failure. By 1892, the battle was lost and standard gauge prevailed across okay, the whole not, system. Like Just hard. imagine... What our railways would be like. All right, fantastic. Now, thank you. Had one. Um, next rock. What is in Dwayne Johnson, uh, Stan? Yeah, if Brunel had won. As I said earlier, if Brunel had won, we could have like really wide trains going really fast. Trains could be much faster, have much higher capacity if we say if if they'd stuck with Brunel's broad gauge. All right. 158 V2. What, like a broad gauge class 158? That would be hilarious. Oh, I hate. Would have been rather new at the time. Yes, indeed. No, none of them. But I may start watching them this year. Let's see the white frame something again. I was going to show this to Oz. Who agrees? Who else here agrees that um, this song goes well with this ending jumping? Somehow I do think that seeing a, bru a broad gauge Brunel locomotive in action and one Daniel Gooch locomotive in action. <laughs> Somehow it does fit with the, um, I do think it fits with the white booted meme and I don't know why. Exactly, Neon. Far higher capacity. Absolutely. Fall apart. Everything. 
right date everything. Oh yeah, there's a couple of really bad skits. Look at how wide he's gotten. Exactly. Horror metal movie about Coke and Melon. Part of me might want to watch that. Okay, while we wait for Electro on Victor to return and hopefully Charcoal to appear as well, let's watch the rest of this DWR documentary from the 80s. The universe is stretched beyond recognition. Train is stretched beyond recognition. Brunel and Daniel Gooch, they really basically wide Putin's the trains. <laughs> So Brunel was dead, and without him, the broad gauge system became an increasing embarrassment for the GWR. With the growth of the national standard gauge network, the Great Western found itself more and more isolated. This was no real problem where passenger traffic was concerned, but goods traffic was a different matter. Oh well, Stan, if you're still there, goods traffic... I know you'd be interested in this, the goods traffic on the GWR. ...traffic was concerned. But goods traffic was a different matter. I knew you'd be interested. One of the first serious drawbacks to be found with Brunel's magnificent broad gauge system was the problem of the transshipment of goods wherever it met a standard gauge railway. Yeah. Well, there was nothing for it but to unload all the goods off a broad gauge train and load it onto a narrow gauge train. Standard so, at a transshipment shed like this one, you'd have broad gauge track on one side of the platform with broad gauge wagons on it, narrow gauge track on the other side for the narrow gauge trains. Yeah, and and standard gauge rails in the chaos of standard boxes, gauge well. and bags in between. Wagons on it, narrow gauge track on the other side for the narrow gauge trains, and an indescribable chaos of boxes, portmanteau, and bags in between. Yeah. Lots of chaos. One answer to the problem was this. Very. To add a third rail to accommodate standard gauge traffic over the broad gauge system. You can see the three rails here. Yes, but by 1892, even the diehards had to admit that Brunel's broad gauge was an anachronism. So the GWR gave in. The entire line would be converted by teams of navvies to the narrow gauge. The task of converting the purely broad gauge line west of Exeter was ambitiously planned for a single weekend in May 1892. Very nice. Well, all they had this to do with with a lot of the system, with a lot of the systems still, um, with a lot of the systems still, um, with a lot of the systems still, um, with a lot of the system already having the third, the third uh, standard gauge rail. All they had to do was take up the broad gauge one. But yeah, the line west of Exeter was completely broad gauge, and that all had to be done in a single weekend, which was the incredible. The broad gauge line west of Exeter was ambitiously planned for a single weekend in May 1892. This reconstruction, filmed by the GWR in the 1930s, captures the melodrama of that momentous weekend. It's from Berlin. He reports that he has finished his inspection of the converted lines, and I can certify that they are fit for narrow gauge traffic tomorrow morning. I mean, standard gauge. Nearly 200 miles of line changed from broad to narrow gauge in two days. The broad gauge stock was gathered together at Swindon and ruthlessly scrapped. An era had passed. A shame. Punch published a cartoon showing Brunel's ghost presiding at the funeral of his beloved broad gauge. Yes. The Great Western Railway was ready to launch into the 20th century. 
In 1884, a tunnel had been built under the Severn estuary. The task had not been without its problems. A great spring was inadvertently tapped during the excavation, flooding the workings. Came across on my team. Yeah, I know. Steam the pumps. task had not been without its problems. A great spring was inadvertently tapped during the excavation, flooding the workings. The only way to deal with the problem was to install these massive Cornish pumping engines, which subsequently kept the tunnel dry for nearly 80 years. With the opening of the tunnel, communications with South Wales were improved out of all recognition. In addition to passenger traffic, Welsh steam coal, the lifeblood of British industry, could flow more easily into England. There was, by now, a new class of passenger. People with the affluence and leisure to take regular seaside holidays. It was the beginning of the golden age of holidays in the West Country. By 1900, 80 million... Goes under a large river. Yeah, the Seven Estuary. It was the beginning of the golden age of holidays in the West Country. By 1900, 80 million people were using the Great Western Railway every year, almost double the number of people using the Western region today. Those places beyond the reach of the trains were made accessible by the first Great Western bus services. Nice. Salt Ash exactly Bridge gave on. the Great Western especially a new like. Cornish the trains such as the Cornish Riviera Express. Saltash Bridge gave the Great Western a near monopoly of the Cornish traffic, but a rival company, the London and South Western Railway, had its own route from Waterloo to Plymouth and the holiday resorts of North Devon. The major prize was the highly lucrative passenger and mail traffic from the transatlantic liners, which at this time called at Plymouth. The trump card in the Great Western Pack was their ability to run trains non-stop from Plymouth to Paddington, which was, at that time, the longest regular non-stop run in the world. Amazing. And I think some of them still do. City class. It was a point of honour for the train crews of both companies to try to outdo the other's performance. During the early 1900s, many spectacular times were achieved between Plymouth and London, using engines like this. Well, the historic rivalry between the London South Western and Great Western companies for the Plymouth Transatlantic traffic finally came to a head on the 9th of May 1904, when an up-Great Western mail train, hauled by this locomotive, number 3717 City of Truro, with the redoubtable driver Moses Clements at the throttle, achieved a speed of 102.3 miles an hour, coming down Wellington Bank near Taunton. It's still... it's still... Fat fact is still debated today. You still there, Stan? On the very day that the Great Western won the upper hand by opening its new, shorter main line between Taunton and Westbury, tragedy struck. In the small hours of the morning, at Salisbury Station, an up London South Western Express failed inexplicably to slow down for the sharp curve through the station. Ooh. It came off the rails. 24 people were killed, including the driver and fireman. The tragedy effectively ended the race to the west. The G-Drive Express failed inexplicably to slow down for the sharp curve through the station. It came off the rails. 24 people were killed, including the driver and fireman. The tragedy effectively ended the race to the west. The GWR had won. Yeah. Oh, um, just very quickly, guys, I'm going to run upstairs and I've got a book upstairs in my room called A to Z of Famous Express Trains. I also wanted to tell you all about some of the GWR's named express trains that it ran during the Big Four era.
And I think I'll do this for all of my um, big four company streams. I'll just run up and get the book. I'll be back in a moment. Okay, unfortunately I've been unable to find that book. Thought I had it somewhere, but I, I, I didn't. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm a jet on a ski. Someone's the book is so enjoyable? Alright. Went to get a book. No, I didn't. Yeah, I've been unable to find that book. Actually, there are some bookshelves along here. It might be somewhere here. The bookshelves in this room. <coughs> oh dear. Sorry guys, that was a bit of a waste of time. 
bit embarrassing. Demolition Factory. Um... Just want to show you all arguably that the Great Western Railway's most well known named train, the Cornish Riviera Express. Library of Many Wonders. Absolutely. Pulled by one of the Castle class locomotives. Amazing. No sound, unfortunately. Our Cornish Riviera Express excursion. Exactly. Cornish Riviera storms through Swindon. Neon, it was very, um, steam trains were, holidays were very evocative with steam trains. Thanks for coming. Here we are. Oh, this might be heavily copyrighted, that one we just saw. This might be a good one to watch. Hello Hornby fans and welcome to another episode of From the Archives. Yeah, yeah, I did. The series where we delve back into the archives to look at locomotives and sets from years gone by. This time we take a look at the Cornish Riviera Express. Released in 1997, the Cornish Riviera Express represents the West Country of the 50s, when King Class locomotives hauled the premier rated services of the. BRT oh, I thought it was Castle region. Class that pulled the, those Local trains. Class locomotives hauled the premier rated services of the BR Western region. The locomotive is King Charles I in the BR livery of the time. Holding coaches in the famous chocolate and cream of the region's former GWR identity. Included in this set is a British Railways King Class locomotive, two British Railways Mark I composite coaches, one British Railways Mark I brake coach, an oval of track, a transformer, a train controller, and a Hornby track map.
the last time. Victor would come back by now. Unquestionably, Jacob. Right. Now let's travel ten years later and look at the 2007 Cornish Riviera Express. One looks better, nicer coaches. The first difference you may notice is the Hornby logo. The logo on the 1997 Cornish Riviera Express was used between 1986 to 1998. Included Iron in the 2007 uniform. set, Iron Dragon. The logo on the 90 which is the name of a roller coaster, Iron Dragon. The first difference you may notice is the Hornby logo. The logo on the 1997 Cornish Riviera Express was used between 1986 to 1998. Included in the 2007 set yes, it is. was a GWR 460 Castle Class Cardigan. Oh, they did. Oh, so the castles and the kings pulled the um, Cornish Included Riviera in Express. Okay, that's set. In fact, they also pulled the Cheltenham GW Flyer. Included in the 2007 set was a GWR 460 Castle Class Cardigan Castle Locomotive. Cardigan Castle. Two GWR Centenary Composite Coaches, a GWR Centenary Brake Coach, a Power Track, a Buffer Stop, a Train Controller, a Wall Mounted Power Unit, and a Hornby Track Map. This set had a limited run of just 2,000 sets, and to prove it, you get a numbered certificate of authenticity. Nice. Iron Dragon the very first train. Fast passenger service from London Paddington to Penzance commenced in. In fact, um, in fact, um, one of the steam locomotive classes of Yellens was known as the Dragon class. There was a series of four six zero, um, of four six zero passenger locomotives. Series of four six zero passenger locomotives known as the Dragon class, heavily based on the castles and the kings of the GWR. The very first Boring. Exactly. I, I honestly couldn't have put it better myself, Jacob. The very first fast passenger service from London Paddington to Penzance commenced in 1867, but it was not until 1904 that the service was given the name the Cornish Riviera Express. Over the years, the speed of the service increased, as did the comfort, and by 1935, the train comprised of the then modern centenary coaches. In 1938, the service was nationalised and is still operated today by the first Great Western. The locomotive and centenary coaches in this set are a splendid... Except it no longer carries the Cornish Riviera Express name. At least I don't think it does. How many were produced? Shame we only have... Yeah, 31 were built. There's only three have been preserved, though. I believe we also have uh, 16 hall classes, including modified halls. We still have 16 halls left, including modified halls, um, eight castle classes, and nine manors. So of um, Colette's um, 460s, main range of 460s, I think there's like 36 left in total. Far fewer than there once were, but hey. But hey, it's better than none at all. In the Great Western Railway colours of the mid to late 1930s. Indeed. That is that is beautiful. Which set is your favourite? Did you own a Cornish Riviera Express? Let us know in the comments below. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe. This has been Hornby from the Archives, and we'll see you next time. Lovely. Hello Hornby fans and welcome Gotta go. 
No problem, Rob. Thanks for coming. See you next week. Are Odd and Victor coming back, though? And if not, is Choco going to show up? Yeah, let's have a look at this. Let's finish this documentary. There's still some interesting information. The Great Western here. Company now set about revolutionising railway engineering. That Swindon Works. They hauled workshop practice out of the Victorian era into the modern age, and the machinery was built to last. Oh, you you got to go as well, Martin. No problem. Thanks for coming. In. The Great Western Company now set about revolutionising railway engineering. They hauled workshop practice out of the Victorian era into the modern age, and the machinery was built to last. Top gear, top of car. Was Over the years of the 19th century, Swindon Works acquired a reputation for excellence in mechanical engineering, which soon became the envy not just of British railway engineers, but of mechanical engineers the world over. One of the oldest surviving machines in the works today is this massive hydraulic press, originally installed to force Probably the now. wheels... Oh, he's, oh, he's in over. Top Gear's hovercock. One of the yeah. oldest surviving machines in the works today is this massive hydraulic press, Originally installed to force the wheels of broad gauge nice locomotives toe. onto their axles, <laughs> yes. the oldest surviving machines in the works today is this massive hydraulic press. Originally installed to force the wheels of broad gauge locomotives onto their axles by exerting a force of 640 tons. It's still here today, and still doing the job for which it was designed. The men who worked at the Great Western Locomotive Works were a breed apart. Fiercely proud of the company and of their working traditions. Well, it was a boyhood ambition of everyone to follow their father and come into the railway works. There was nothing else here really to do, but it was the accepted thing. If your father worked in the railway, you went into the railway. Do you hear this talk of the Japanese looking after their, their people from the cradle to the grave? Well, we were looked after from the cradle to the grave. The working conditions were a lot different then, weren't they, Fred? No smoking, no lunch breaks, but still, we used to enjoy it. If you want a cigarette, you got to get inside the tender and get your mate to keep a lookout for you. Tap the booter or tender wherever you were, letting all the form was coming along. We used to hear the men talk in here then. They thought that we had it cushy when we came in. They talked of the days when they came into work and they went home to breakfast. And after they had their breakfast, they came back to work and then they worked what would then be a normal shift until dinner time, as they called it. And the hooter would go. The whole town was ruled by the hooter. All of Swindon ruled by the hooter. hooter. Because when an engine went out of that shop out here, that was part of you going out with it. Your toe, your sweat went in that engine, and you were very, very proud to see it go on the line. And we used to spend hours cleaning up the copper seams in the firebox. And yet knowing full well that as soon as they lit a fire, it would be all black again. But it did make no difference. That was the way it had to be. All over here was nothing else but engines. And, uh, you know, I enjoy every minute of it. I wish we could get more steam now, but I'm afraid those days are gone forever. The company was fortunate in having, as its locomotive superintendent, from 1902 to 1921, a man who left behind a oh, range of locomotive actually. designs which was to serve until the end of steam itself. The designs were based on a careful study of the best engineering from all over the world. And the engines were constructed using a range of standardised components made from the best available materials. That's gone a bit quiet. The man's name, it's strange George that Electro Jackson, still over the world. Returned. And the engines were constructed using a range of standardised components made from the best available materials. The man's name, George Jackson Churchwood. After his retirement, Churchwood continued to take a keen interest in the locomotive affairs of the Great Western Railway paying frequent visits to Swindon Works to check on the progress of his successors. Why did, why did With advancing years, he became increasing for locomotive affairs of the Great Western Railway, paying frequent visits to Swindon Works to check on the progress of his successors. With advancing years, he became increasingly deaf, until on the misty morning of 19th of December 1933, he was crossing the line from his home to the works when he was run down and killed by Dan Express. Just there. <laughs> After Churchwood's death, his design concepts continued to be used. 
This locomotive is one of a large class of oh, engines goodness. that were mass produced at the Swindon Works. The Hall class. Well, this is number 5900 Hinderton Hall, one of the Hall class, which were built from 1928 onwards, basically as a small wheeled version of the standard Churchwood 460 of 1902. They were used all over the Great Western system on secondary expresses, parcels, trains, fast freight traffic, that sort of thing, and were generally the workhorses of the company. There were 330 of them built, and as you'll understand, there was a shortage of desirable residences to name them after. They were reduced to names like Caxton Hall, Albert Hall, Marble Hall, and there was a malicious rumour that the last one was to be christened That's Hall. Yeah, I do also want to briefly touch on the manners now that three of the four Collett's um, 460s have been mentioned. I do also want to briefly touch on the last one. Um, Uh, the manners. Exactly. Uh, 1985, um, neon. To the moon of the... Oh God. God's wonderful railway. The Great Western Railway was by now a national institution. Its publicity department carried its image out to the public. It became associated with romance and reliability. The GWR became affectionately known as God's Wonderful Railway. The company was way ahead of its time in realising the importance of a strong corporate image. Every article associated with the railway bore a crest or insignia, and the initials GWR became indelibly stamped on the public consciousness. In the 1930s, the Great Western Railway even took to the air. This bit's interesting. Oh yes, NLP fan. This bit's interesting because some of the safety features that the Great Western Railway pioneered are um, became incorporated in today's. Um, I don't know, NLP fan. Became um, became incorporated in today's railway safety features. I yes, I did know that neon, because um, it was like a patented design, something to do with patent policies. Um, yeah, I've seen Train of Thoughts video on that. <laughs> the Great Western's reputation for safety continued to grow. This was due in no small measure to a system of automatic train control developed from 1906 onwards. This provided the driver with an audible warning in his cab as to whether or not the next signal was at danger. A bell indicated clear and a siren indicated caution. If the driver... Yes. That was the... Um... That was the basis of the, AW of the AWS. They still use similar tones. Similar tones are still used 
in train cabs to alert the driver of what the next signal is. Even today, on trains today, it became standardised. A standardised safety feature across the whole network. Exactly. I failed to acknowledge the caution. <laughs> If the driver failed to acknowledge the caution signal, the brakes were automatically applied. But even the automatic train control system was not 100% proof against human error. One dark night at Norton Fitzwarren in 1940, a driver, under extreme stress, misread the signals. Subconsciously, he cancelled the warning sirens. He brought about a major tragedy. As the Dan newspaper train thundered through, the Dan mail train, as we've heard, was not obeying signals, and ran through the trap point, along roughly by these bramble bushes, and through the sand drag along here. Well, the King-class locomotive, number 6028, King George VI, burst through the end of the sand drag, I went floundering ahead on its own wheels for perhaps 300 yards in that direction before turning over on its side foul of the down main line. As the down newspaper train went past, the guard felt something strike his arm. Realising something was amiss, he applied the vacuum brake and pulled the train up at the next signal box, Victory Crossing, about two miles in that direction. On examining his van, he found what it was that had struck his arm. It was a rivet head from the bogey frame of King George VI, which a split yeah. second after the newspaper train had pulled clear, reeled right across both the down and up main lines, totally blocking them. That newspaper train had the luckiest escape in railway history. Absolutely. These two houses mark the spot where the accident happened 45 years ago. It was roughly here that King George well, VI were. came to rest on his left-hand side. With wreckage strewn all over both main oh, lines. Oh, don't, it's don't worry, in a train on a 76. Welcome. We may go for a little bit longer. We may go until 10.45. I'm quite enjoying this. It's watching an, a documentary from the 80s about the GWR at the line. moment. It's later years. As the down newspaper train went past, the guard felt something yeah, strike his arm. Yeah, it was Realising something was amiss, he applied the vacuum brake and pulled the train up at the next signal box. Probably crashing. That would be, yeah, that'd be cool. On examining his van, he found what it was that had struck his arm. It was a rivet head from the bogey frame of King George VI, which a split second after the newspaper train had pulled clear, reeled right across both the down and up main lines, totally blocking them. That newspaper train had the luckiest escape in railway history. Yeah. These two houses mark the spot where the accident happened 45 years ago. It was roughly here that King George VI came to rest on his left-hand side, with wreckage strewn all over both main lines. 27 people, including the firemen, have been killed and 56 seriously injured. The driver, however, was relatively unhurt, apart from shock. And when asked how he felt, replied, Don't talk to me, I'm a murderer. Oh, God. He never Poor drove a main guy. line train again, and within a year he was dead. For no clearly identifiable medical cause. Exactly. Hang on. He was dead. For no clearly identifiable medical cause. No clearly identifiable. Exactly. <laughs> being gone by fire. Oh dear. We're all being scrapped. As with the other railway companies, the Great Western shouldered immense burdens throughout the Second World War moving millions of civilians and service personnel millions of miles. With the coming of peace, the railways were in a sorry state, run down and under-maintained. But rather than see the railway companies properly recompensed for their war efforts, doctrinaire politicians aimed a deadly blow at the entire industry. The railways were nationalised. Great Western Railway, in name, ceased to exist. What a shame. In the great steam purges of the mid-60s, the vast majority of British Railway's locomotives were... Well, you weren't the British purges. Rail, really. Well, in the Western region, technically. In the great steam purges of the mid-60s, the vast majority of British Railway's locomotives were summarily broken up. 
Apart from those which were bought for scrap by the South Wales firm of Wooden Brothers of Barry. Wooden Brothers Scrapyard Barry. Yeah, Very famous for, 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 for preserving a lot of Southern Railway and Great Western Railway locomotives. Mostly Great Western, though. Okay. Huge underground base to test vehicles as such supply for the war. Oh, cool. Those which were bought for scrap by the South Wales firm of Wooden Brothers of Barry. Where they oh, were, by a quirk of the scrap trade almost, preserved in this amazing elephant's graveyard of the scrap trade almost. Pre where they were, by a quirk of the scrap trade almost. Oh, preserved that's brilliant. Uh, train up, train up a of the South six. Wales firm of Wooden Brothers of right. Barry. Where they were, by a quirk of the scrap trade almost, preserved in this amazing elephant's graveyard of Barry Island. In some cases, for more than 20 years. In the preservation oh, of most... Pres hear that. Where they were, by a quirk of the scrap trade almost, preserved in this amazing elephant's graveyard at Barry Island. In some cases, for more than 20 years. In the preservation movement, I suppose, owes a debt of gratitude to Wooden Brothers in that uh, there's so much stuff exactly that's still preserved in this... I imagine they would have. Where they were... By a quirk of the scrap trade, almost preserved in this amazing elephant's graveyard at Barry Island, in some cases for more than 20 years. And the preservation movement, I suppose, owes a debt of gratitude to Wooden Brothers in that uh, there's so much stuff that's still available here for preservation. One of the locos here, number 4277, Great Western Railway Churchwood 280 tank loco. Retired in the mid-60s, been here ever since. Lived all their life in the Welsh coal trade. Now sitting here, slowly rotting away, waiting to be rescued. And number 4277 has now been rescued and now bears the name Hercules. Very fitting for such a strong tank engine. And now works on the Painted and Dartmouth Railway in Devon. So yeah, we do have... Wooden Brothers to thank for a lot of. Yeah. Yeah, 42XX engine. Yeah, incredible how, um... Incredible how engines were still at Barry even in the 80s. Yeah, 4277 got out of Barry just a year after this was filmed. You saw Hercules in real life a few times, have you, Train Lover 77? Brilliant. One of my sisters, Salmon Trout's boiler. I do believe... Didn't we say... Didn't we establish that Salmon Trout's boiler is still around? Oh, a lot of BR-built steam locomotives were also um, sent here. Look at them all. Not all of them were... Um, Not all of them were, um, well, um, I think, um, oh, shit. I think, I think Barry Island's completely empty now. All the engines from there have been rescued now. And they would get up, end up getting sent to the other scrapyard and weren't so lucky exactly. Oh, brilliant train number 76. Absolutely. Due to a derailment. King Edward II. Yeah, but I, yeah, I, I believe King Edward II is one of the three um, um, King class um, engines that have been preserved. I suppose... 
King Edward the, the Second's derailment is what um, King Edward the Second's derailment is what is what earned, earned it its spot in preservation. I know, Neon. Thankfully, as we've t as I've said before, more engines who were sent to Barry Scrapyard. More engines who were sent to Barry Scrapyard ended up being rescued than actually scrapped. Because Barry... Because Wooden Brothers found it more cost-effective, they'd be able to make more profit if they scrapped rolling stock instead of locomotives. So they were all put on the back burner. That became a very common quote. I think a lot of them have, or a lot of, most if not all of these engines have been saved now, but unfortunately some of them haven't yet been restored to working order, despite being preserved. Trains have feelings, I, I say, and uh, neon. If I'd been around in the 80s, if I'd been around in the 80s, at my age, I definitely would have purchased one of these engines from Barry, if so many were still there in the 80s. A bad day for steam, it certainly was. But many people were determined that this should not be the end of the story. Many and groups, it wasn't including the, the Barry story. A bad day for steam, it certainly was. But many people were determined that this should not be the end of the story. Many groups, including the Barry Absolutely Steam Locomotive Action wrong. Group, led by Mike Cocaine. Many groups, including the Barry Steam Locomotive Action Group, led by Mike Cocaine, are determined to save as many of these engines as possible. Yeah, yeah most people see in this lying here, 6023, King Edward II. Mm. They say, well, anybody who tries oh, to Oh, this is the engine that, you were just referring to. The Barry to, Steam um, Locomotive Action Group, led by Mike uh, Cocaine. James are determined to save seconds. as many of these engines as possible. Oh, great, so. yeah, most people see in this lying here, 6023, King Edward II, mm. they say, well, anybody who tries to restore that to gain order must be an absolute loony, but I think Come you've on. got to be a bit that way, haven't you, really? Well, anyone who tries to restore any of them must have got yeah. to be an absolute loony, but this yeah. one's got character. Yeah. You literally <laughs> just said yeah. that, Neon! Say, God, well, these, <laughs> these guys are taking... Are taking the words right out of your mouth, guys. Well, he tries to restore that to gain order. Must be an absolute loony, but I think yeah. you've got to be a bit that way, haven't you, really? Well, anyone who tries to restore any of them has got yeah. to be an absolute loony, but this yeah. one's got character. Yeah. It's got to be saved. It's got to have something special about it. Um, it's got to be a bit different. Uh, if, if you have that, then you find that people do take an interest in it without, work, without anyone working too hard. Six or seven hundred people have contributed towards it in different ways. Um, you know, little old ladies shoving 50p in a tin or to someone sending you a cheque for a hundred quid. It's, it's as varied as that. Um, I, I always like to call it the people's engine because uh, so many people in, have sort of willingly and voluntarily thrown money into the pot. Resurrected from the Barry Scrapyard, 7812 Earl Stoke Manor is one of a number of Great Western locomotives, lovingly restored and running on the Seven Valley Railway in the West Midlands. 
I've been pulled by that very engine. I've been pulled by... I was pulled by Earl Stoke Manor. I was pulled by Earl Stoke Manor. On the, uh... The, uh... On the Seven Valley Railway. He literally just mentioned that. Yeah, I remember being pulled by this engine. From the Barry Scrapyard... 7812 Earl Stoke Manor is one of a number of Great Western locomotives lovingly restored and running on the Seven Valley Railway in the West Midlands. Here, Great Western engines can be seen operating in their true environment, surrounded by all the paraphernalia that makes railways endlessly fascinating. I was also pulled by Ravensbourne Hall on the, um, oh, I can't remember what was, Raven something Hall on the uh, West Somerset Railway when I went there. And I've also been pulled, been pulled by, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the hall class that's currently on loan to the Bluebell Railway. But I've been, I was pulled by that last year. I may have been on the place. Went up about 300 metres. Cafe Early Castle, nice. No, I, that heat wave didn't affect me. It didn't affect me in 
left and right. Legacy. Left behind and right legacy. Lovely, James. Lovely. Well, it doesn't look like God and Victor are coming back anyway, and it doesn't look like we're going to see Charcoal. What is he online? Oh, but he's on his phone, so... It doesn't look like we're going to see Electro back either. Okay. Well, that was a great line to end to end this stream on. We've basically covered the entire GWR's history from initial, from initial conception and seen a, a very big um, variety of GWR engines in this stream. Lots of my favorites. Yeah, I'm about to end the stream anyway, Davin. Thanks for coming. Yeah, we basically covered the entire, the GWR's entire history from its, from its initial conception under Brunel, all the way up to preservation and the legacy it left behind. The GWR and the other big four companies are gone, but they're not forgotten. And in the upcoming streams this year, I'll talk about what made the three other companies so great as well. As great as the Great Western Railway. So yeah, great line to end that stream on that, to end this stream on that was. I hope you've all enjoyed yourselves tonight. Thank you so much for coming to tonight's stream. Yeah, this stream was about as fun as I was hoping it would be. Maybe just not, just an ever so slightly not quite as fun. I did hope that Odd would be here for a bit longer. I did hope that Odd and Electro would be here a bit longer. Still had a lot to tell Odd, but then he got called away by Heather, by, by Luna and um, Stingy, but oh well. Exactly, Neon, exactly. And I'm, I'm also a bit disappointed we haven't even reached 200 views while live. Very disappointing that we haven't even reached 200 views while live. But oh well. Don't know what's going on with the lack of views on my streams recently, but oh well. Yeah, I hope you all enjoyed yourselves tonight, guys. Did have more to tell Electro and um, Odd. So I wish they were here a bit more, and I wish Charcoal was here too, but... Oh, well, yeah, it is close enough. Well, hopefully next week's stream won't... will be just as... Hopefully next week's stream... Well, no, no Neon, it, it was to my expectations mostly, but not quite. Oh, there you are, Electro. Oh, you were busy with your... You were still busy with your drawings, were you, Electro? You are still busy with your drawings? Yeah, I get that too, but oh well. I still hope that Odd was here more. I still had a lot to tell him. I wanted to show him the blasting of Box Tunnel. But oh well. I wanted to show him the blasting of Box Tunnel. Showed everyone else. I didn't get to show him and Victor though, but oh well. But yeah, I hope you all enjoyed this regardless. Hope you all enjoyed yourselves tonight regardless. Oh yeah, and I wanted to show him the wide, the the, the um the broad gauge trains truffing to the wide Putin music. 
I'll probably show him that in next week's stream. But also, guys, so guys, don't forget, tomorrow I'm going to be, um, finish it all off. I, I get that. All right. Well, yeah, as I said, guys, don't forget, guys, tomorrow, as my, as my parents and sister will have set off on their skiing holiday, I'll be doing a, um, spy, I'll be doing another bonus Spyro stream tomorrow, from 6.30 to 10.30, hope you're all looking forward to that, then next week, next Friday, I'll be going to Chessington World of Adventures, and so that live stream, well, I probably will anyway. And so that live stream will, um, and so that live stream will, oh, for goodness sake. What was I want, what did I want to say? And so that, I'll be talking about my Chessington trip a lot in that stream and Chessington World of Adventures in general. But I, I think I will also show on the wide train thing, um, Uh, during that stream, as I didn't get to show him it. I can make up then. Make it up to you. Fantastic. That's lovely, Electro. Thank you. Back for real next week. All right. Fantastic. Then I can show the wide train. The wide train. Broad gauge train with the Putin music. <laughs> the link. Spyro for my Skyrite Speedway drawing. Fantastic. So yeah, I hope you're all looking forward to my upcoming live streams and videos. Should be all very, very fun. Might see if I can get another, um, um, another VHS review out during the week when my, um, the rest of my family is away. But we'll have to see what happens. I can't guarantee it, but we'll have to wait and see what happens. All right. There is always next week. I know. I know, Electro, and I'll... I'll show them to you. I'll try and show them to you next week as well. But yeah, I hope you're looking forward to next week's Friday stream and tomorrow's bonus Spyro stream. Thanks again for coming, everyone. I hope you all enjoyed yourselves. Oh, and I hope you're all looking forward to the three other big four company streams I have planned for this year. Yeah, thanks again for coming, everybody. Hope you all... Enjoyed yourselves. Why do I keep losing my train of thought? I hope you're looking forward to all of my upcoming content. Please like, comment, share this stream with your friends. Don't forget to subscribe to me, Train Lover 16, if you haven't already. And I will see you all in my next video. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye.